always I always forget to turn the damn thing on. Miss miss the downbeat. That's the yep. classic the yep. classic yeah. uh, beginner's mistake. Usually catch the second or third song. So, so uh, I'm Gary Louie. I'm in Seattle, Washington here, and uh, I work at the University of Washington School of Music, where I've been here for decades uh, doing recordings and fixing stuff. And uh, I'm an AES Life member and uh, secretary of the AES Pacific Northwest section in Seattle. And uh, I'm uh, also on the AES Tellers Committee to run the elections. So I am, uh, I am kind of embarrassed because we usually have a bunch of uh, ne'er-do-wells at TTT <laughs> from around the world. And you know, they're talking about all sorts of stuff, audio stuff. And, and one guy showed slides of his father's uh, early life in Milwaukee <laughs> and some other stuff like that. So I figured I would just be showing a bunch of slides to um, people for entertainment, basically, instead of uh, some of the uh, most august names in the tape world now. I, I, the only people, I, I, I don't see John French here. That, that would about complete it, I think. So uh, if they gave you the title, I, I think I said something like I was going to just show my experiences with um, uh, analog tape machine uh, alignments, mechanical alignments, uh, and the reference plane for these tape machines. And I'm certain every one of you guys knows about this, but I, I didn't know that I thought a bunch of rookies would be here. <laughs> so mostly I've got slides and I just kind of chat about them. And uh, a lot of these you'll have Actually, seen. Actually, I've before. mostly left that sort of thing up to John French and I've never bothered to do it myself, so. Yeah, well, if he were here, I'm sure he would probably be able to point out uh, uh, all of the problems with uh, what, what I ended up doing. So uh, I'm gonna share a screen and uh so am i on and gary you want people to uh talk about your problems here that you sure okay <laughs> um so uh i've uh I've, first i've just got a bunch of random photos of uh tape machines because i figured a lot of people we, we've had some younger people who really don't know what a tape machine does it looks cool to them or something like that so I was going to just show a bunch of uh, tape machine porn first. And let's see if I can get the uh, the slides to move. This is just a, a PDF of a bunch of pictures I have. And so this is a uh, out of a Ravox. It's a head, and uh, I've taken the cap off the top. And I think it just it's a pretty good example to show you what a what this kind of head looks like. Little coils of wire, and uh, it doesn't really show the laminations very well, but... Uh, I figured uh, just for tape machine porn here, it looks like in the future we'll, we'll all be wearing hoodies and running two inch tape machines, but it does show a nice uh, kind of open picture in their in their sales spiel, including a nice uh, die cast top plate and uh, uh, I'm guessing fairly precision milled there to hold stuff. And the the three m series i'm sure some of you guys know those um the point here i think was that you do have these reels of tape spinning around if people haven't played with tape they they can be rather heavy and they've got to be moved fairly carefully and accurately i i just love some of these pictures of course they're a lot of them from the 70s and 80s and but you guys have pretty much all seen these things. So I was just going to take the classic AG440 style transport and show the, the various parts, the guides, the head block, and so on. Uh, and to infer that everything has to move on that reference plane or be measured from the reference plane. And I'm not sure whether it's better to take the center line of the tape or to take the bottom edge of the tape. And uh, the only photo I found there from the Ampex manual there about the, it looks like the die cast uh, top frame from an AG, taking the pictures from below, it looks like. And yet the, uh, the let's see, this is the AG440. 
Unfortunately, they don't show the titles on that, so I gotta have the titles somewhere else. Yeah, AG440 manual. So they do give a little measurement, 33.5 millimeters from the motor mount bracket. And for those that uh, had never seen the uh, head block of an AG440 style, this looks like the half inch. And pointing out the various parts of it, including the Ruby guides for the C series. And, and their method of adjusting it. Now, I do not have this little tool. I, do all you guys that do the 440s have the little guide adjustment tool from Ampex? No, nope. I have one for quarter inch. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have one. So what do you do if you don't have these little tools and you can't just phone up Ampex nowadays and get one of them? You have to what look on eBay or something like that. And gauge, how do you know gauge it's blocks? You just yeah. use gauge blocks. Yeah. So they do say take a flat surface plate and apparently stick the head block on there and use their little uh, guide adjustment tool. And if you got an AG uh, or an MCH, MCI, and I, I put this in here so people who don't normally see tape machines see what an MCI GH110 looks like, uh, they do pretty much say, don't touch anything. <laughs> Many sensitive <laughs> and critical adjustments only experienced factory trained technicians using proper tools should be able to make any adjustments in the tape path. Uh, well, you know, you know, what if it's 50 years later and the guy gave you this one in a garage? Do you send the whole thing to John French? Mm, well, maybe some of us can't afford to quite do that or, or something like that. Have other circumstances? Yeah, he's not much into fixing tape machines anymore, just heads. Yeah, and my, my understanding is you send him the head block and he has the magic numbers to fix your heads and stick them back in the block and get them all lined up almost perfectly. And then you take it home and, and do the azimuth. Um, right. And you and take it home and put it on the machine and discover that the capstan shaft isn't quite vertical. And Yeah, or any number of other problems or any of the right. rollers or guy, the guides bent or something like that. Uh, anyway, this is from the uh, MCI book and they do give uh little numbers for adjusting the tape path and um i i don't have an mci i've got the sony the the last iteration of that and they uh mci has this uh, procedure where they apparently want you to use parallels steel blocks and uh, uh go from head to head or from guide to head and i uh, i'm i'm not sure i quite follow that and I think there's easier ways to do that with a surface plate and gauge blocks. Um, and has everyone seen G. Parnid's uh, tombstone? You know, I didn't know about this, but apparently that's real. <laughs> so, um, Gary, on that MCI shot you had up a, a few seconds ago there, um, that that one is the reference point there, um, just the edge of there's a, a little sunken in area where the controls are for the machine. Is is that the line that you're supposed to use for that? Do you know? I'm 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 sitting at one right now <laughs> as we speak. So I just was looking at the picture and looking down and thinking that looks like that's about where the edge of the the recessed area is with all the controls in it. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure exactly what MCI uh, is going for here because I haven't studied it because I don't have the MCI. Yeah, so th this is this is where I'm sitting right now, just by chance. And right, you know, that looks like it like it could be this this line right here in that picture. But I I'm just curious. Oh, I yeah. am not sure. I think uh, I am usually looking for what looks like uh, the the absolute reference casting or right. whatever underneath there and that it be milled to some kind of precision uh reference and you know all the decorative plates are are no good as far as right. i'm concerned i'm not okay. sure if they are saying you should take the whole head block off and put it on a surface plate and then use parallels to to try to gauge the uh the trueness which if seems want, a little goofy to me if you look at my picture you'll see i'm pointing at a uncovered deck plate 
or an MCI. Yeah, let's highlight Alan. Yeah. Ta uh, oh, yeah. So you've taken the beauty plate off. Yeah. So it's and, just a flat deck plate. Uh, that's not cast. That's just a sheet. Yeah, but there's okay. no place to measure from. Mm. But is that plate considered the reference plane to no, how, no. They, how they I set it up? <laughs> I've never been to one of the tape machine factories to see what they typically do. Hey, Gary. Yeah. I thought that uh, with an MCI, you you do take the head plate off and reference it to the surface you're putting the head the head block on. Yeah, and, that's in what other I'm words, doing. you do that externally and then line the guides up to the head block. But the guides themselves, they they there's not that much adjusting you can do. You just tighten them down, basically. You yeah. have to shim them. You can shim them if they seem to be wildly off for some reason. But then I suppose you would have to suspect is that top plate bent or something like that from a drop off a truck. Exactly. I think I think the way it's supposed to work is the guides are the correct height and the head block gets aligned off the machine. Yeah. Well, it would be nice if you found what looks like a good reference and can at least check some of that stuff. And those the, the dancer arms in particular tend to worry me because they seem to get bent quite a bit and trying to get them uh, straight, true, and uh, at the right height seems to be a constant battle. So here's the, the backside of a head block. Uh, where is my, oh, there it is. Yeah. Which one so is that? These... MCI. Right. So these are, are the reference point for the head block. So right. that's probably the reference point would be off of these posts. Yep. I agree with Alan. Similar to Sony. Is, is there only two for the MCI block there? Yes, there is only the two. Oh, yeah. APR 5000s have three. <laughs> yeah, well, three the, points the is way to, more, more stable. The best way to define a plane is three points. Yeah. Well, we have a, a series of planes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I, I've always seen the similarities to the APR, Sony APR 5000s from the MCI designs. Uh, neat. So, um, G. Parned, yeah. Um, and I, Gary? I, yeah. Can I make a comment on that MCI spec? Yeah. Because what I think they're saying is, and it's something that I've done with the APRs, is that you're looking for your vertical based on, they're saying, assume you're, the fixed guides are correct and adjust the heads to them. Is I think what that second paragraph is saying. Yeah, um, I, I, I think you're right. I do notice on my APR that the fixed guides on the head block do have some little plastic shims under them. And I'm, I'm guessing they still have a magic number that that has to meet to get those guides exactly where they want them. Right. It's, it's actually a very complicated equation. If you could put this, my camera up for a second, this is an APR uh, casting. And one of the things you see all those holes, the, the, the bosses that have holes tapped in them? Oh, those yeah. Are, those are all milled during manufacturing to an exact height. Yeah, I've got a shot of uh, just the uh, tape head area that'll show those bosses. Okay. And that is, but the problem is, I don't see any real reference on this casting other than those milled uh plate so i don't know how you can get a, a, a gauge block in there yeah that that is the problem i don't <laughs> um you can make me go away now <laughs> okay so the old uh, ampex atr 100 series uh, i don't have one don't have much experience with it so just uh to show uh, others that haven't seen these i just sh am showing the head block here and I'm uh, assuming this from the Ampex pamphlet is fairly accurate. And if people needed to see uh, tape surface, and they, it looks like they have ceramic lower edge guides, uh, the old scrape flutter and, filter, which John Chester will talk about. And the and ceramic upper guide. Down the right center. side up, Gary. Pardon? 
Is that upside down or right side up? That picture. This is right side up. They start with a solid reference block. Apparently so. And as John, I think, was saying, they have a ceramic uh, disc type upper edge guide in the middle. Right. But it's, the problem with setting up an ATR head block is it's got this big mounting shaft sticking out the bottom of it. So you can't just set it on your surface plate unless, like John French, you have gone into the machine shop and milled yourself an adapter, which has a hole in the center for the mounting shaft to go into and holds it at a specified distance parallel to the surface plate. Yeah, here's a shot of a ATR bottom. Want to highlight, Ellen? Let's highlight Alan here. Let's see. All right, there's the shaft sticking out of the bottom. There it is, yeah. Yeah, that's, and here here and here are the mounting plates. Is it, uh, and then and one, one in the front, one, front, well, one front in the front the center as well. So it's just, it's yeah. there's three reference points. So a little, little round milled reference points correct yep correct. yeah and then uh, well as as i understand the atr when it was designed they took a lot of what they did in their instrumentation recorders and made the head almost non-adjustable uh that that's little, pretty much that's pretty much true yeah there's very little that's adjustable on an atr head block the ceramic guides are the height they are. You can't change it. I suppose you could put a shim under one, but I have never heard of anyone having to do such a thing. Um, and the heads are uh, attached to mounts, so there's no height adjustment or zenith adjustment on the heads. You just screw it all together and it's supposed to be correct. And I those recall gears are too azimuth, I believe. But I think the range is fairly low. Correct. I think, yeah, John no. mentioned uh, that the geared looking discs underneath the heads are, in fact, beveled discs with a, a gear drive. And, and that's what adjusts the azimuth, which is like the Nagra system. And but I have Nagra... actually had one tape where the azimuth was so bad that I had to stick a shim under one side of the head mount in order to get the azimuth adjusted. Uh, Nagra used to sell different thicknesses uh, that give you a packet of five beveled head discs, and you really? were to, you were to pick pick the one that uh, had the <laughs> correct height according to their height gauge. And I've got a photo of that coming later to show the Nagra four height thing. Uh, okay, so um, Alan, you want to rest your arms? Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's see. Can we unhighlight him? He is on highlight. And I dug up some of these old uh, things. This is one of those old 3M sound talk things, just to show the basic head alignment. Uh, because I had expected a lot of people who'd never seen a tape machine or realized that the head has to be moved in three or maybe four directions. Yeah, and at and, some point, uh, we've really got to round up some of those youngsters and teach them some of this. Yeah, it, because uh, it's not like the machines are going away, and it's not like we don't have uh, 100 years of tape recordings that someone might want to play someday. Right. So there's uh, there's that lovely diagram, the, cro the, the side view there of the tape reel and the tape moving, and some little formulas there. And uh, another one of these 3M diagrams that shows the simplified tape path. So they go by the tape path center line, and uh, I've heard some people go by the bottom edge of the tape. I don't know. John, you got an opinion on that? Um, Easier to find no, the bottom not really. line of the tape. I mean, if you're, I don't know how you find the tape path center line. Yeah. Uh, if you're measuring, it seems to me you have to measure to the bottom or the top. And yeah. I would usually choose the bottom, but work from there. Yeah. But a lot of people also, the newbies, don't realize that that width of the tape can, can vary a lot. Yes. 
So uh, one exaggerated example of what happens when they when they put the uh, the real spindle off by one degree and you uh, you get the improper pedestal positioning. And one of these drawings I uh, got from uh, REP magazine. It's from a Greg Hanks article, I believe. Also showing what happens, showing apparently with two inch type tape and how much distortion uh, you can get with that tape when things are off by a little bit. So uh, I uh, had wanted to just point out that the, the accuracy of everything, uh, where the tape is, how the tape's moved around, as well as in the head block is, is important. And uh, another diagram to, for people who saw one and still haven't gotten the idea about uh, where the tape heads are positioned. And other examples, I'm always intrigued by the service manual instructions. And uh, I, I still, of course, have to look at a lot of consumer stuff, including real cheap stuff. And it's interesting the kinds of directions they'll give you based on the assumption that you're a TV repairman or something like that and have been given this tape recorder to fix and have no tools other than, uh, you know, a sledgehammer and stuff like that. So uh, what is this? This is from Ampex, actually, and it was kind of interesting to show uh, that, yeah, you're supposed to put the uh, grease pencil or something on there and or look at the wear pattern and, and look if it's trapezoidal or straight and so on and whether it's in the center. And another little closer view of it uh, from the Ampex ATR 700 book. And it also shows a couple of the uh, dimensions they are, that are looking for. Anyone use the clear tape thing and actually try to measure this thing? I use clear leader all the time just to do a rough in. Can you still buy it? I don't know. I have a reel of it someplace where you can take old tape and try to <laughs> scrape off some box. This is I also saved from... a bunch of Maxell clear leader or translucent leader from reels. So I have a little box of a quarter and a half for that purpose. Oh, yeah. Um, this from the ATR 700 manual and uh, pointing out sort of some of these adjustment screws are for this particular model. And uh, from John French himself, I uh, took the liberty of just taking one of his drawings here to show a multi-track head uh, wear patterns from the Otari 5050 manual showing headwear also and uh, I, I don't recall if they are advocating the grease pencil thing personally I use a sharpie or, or something like that because I don't like getting grease everywhere and this one from a uh, consumer Sony 366 tape machine uh, and I thought it was interesting to, they did show these dimensions here and wondered how they expected the, the average TV repairman to measure the 0 0.025 millimeters there. Uh, this one's from a TIAC uh, auto reversing machine. Uh, also just to show the, the tape path and uh, uh, heads roughly and head adjustments. And this also from that TIAC machine. Uh, Again, to just to show how uh, some head adjustment parameters. This one from Otari 5050. Yeah, 5050. Also to show uh, head adjustment uh, screws. This one from uh, from the Runstein book, and he's advocating the grease pencil and looking for the wear pattern, exaggerated, of course. Uh, from the Otari 5050, there are uh, instructions for turning the screws <laughs> if you notice that the head height is wrong. And uh, I always figured it must be a way to get that a little more accurately. Another Otari uh, 5050 method is uh, for uh, the tape wrap. And uh, they were saying stick a cotton swab on either side of the tape as it's plain, and if the sound uh, gets gets louder and brighter uh, on one side, then you need to turn it towards that side. And from a consumer machine, again, this is the Sony 366, and I thought it was interesting. They, they advocate looking at the light reflection of the tape distortion as it's moving over the head to see if you've got uh, what kind of little shape you've got on the head. Interesting. 
the classic Ampex uh, track diagram. Again, this is, a lot of this is for people who just have never seen any of this stuff. So I also do cassettes, so what do you do with the cassette? And of course the classic one is to get the information terminals M300 milled uh, cassette plate with the little uh, check bars in it. And you can check the uh, tape guide heights pretty easily by putting it in the machine and uh, the depth of head penetration into the cassette. And uh, there's kind of a grubby example. It seems to be missing the uh, check bar. But you can see the, the little lines for maximum minimum where the head penetration is supposed to be. And if you buy the Apex version or Abex version, which I'm pretty sure you can't get any of this stuff except on the used market anymore. The THD801, this one looks nice. It's in, uh, looks like it's still new in box with the check bar. Let's hope it hasn't, hasn't corroded or anything. So personally, I uh, some years ago bought uh, a clone from the Pentagon Tape Duplicator Company, and it seems to do the trick. Uh, as some people would say, I guess it's it's good enough for cassettes. So is anyone here the uh, the wind band behind me warming up? We do, yes. Okay, there's only so much I can do because I'm at work and there's a <laughs> rehearsal going on next door. Nothing it's to worry about, 19, Gary. It's fine. 1952 soundproofing. So let me just close the one door that's 10 feet away a little more. And what, what leaks through the walls will leak through the walls. Are you way downstairs? I am. Uh, I'm in the basement in the music building, down by next to room 35, the, the band rehearsal room. I remember that room well. Yeah. So uh, this is my uh, uh, deck plate. It's cheap because it looks like it's brass, and some people would say, well, the thermal coefficient of expansion is bad for this, or it'll warp or something, but, you know, I, I figure it's, it's good enough for cassettes. So I also noticed... How do you use that, Gary? Um, you stick the, the brass, in this case, plate, into the cassette well, and there's little uh, rounded pins that all the cassettes are supposed to sit on to hold them at the correct height. Then you turn the machine on, or manually, I, uh, often with the power off, you can manually uh, put the heads in, in play position. And the surface of this plate is a, is a reference plane, and the little steel bar is uh, cassette width on one dimension, and it's just under a quarter inch in the other dimension. And this one is showing it uh, in the quarter inch up position, so that would be OK to check a uh, head penetration. Uh, and then to check the actual cassette tape path, you'd turn it the other direction and slide the little bar around until it clears perfectly uh, any of the cassette tape guides. Uh, I'd noticed that for a, for a big Otari, you used to be able to, and it looks like you still can buy from Precision Motorworks, this uh, custom jig here that uh, replaces the head block and they guarantee has uh, got these uh, uh, high accuracy uh, references around here to align the rest of the machine. And they show how you can use uh, parallels along with the, uh, the gauge block that they sell to install in the machine. I and doubt you can get it anymore. You, you, what's that? I, d I doubt that you can get it from Jeff anymore. Uh, you may be able to rent it. Yeah, maybe he's got one left and you can rent or something. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's still on the web. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the situation is, but uh, have you got one, Alan? Uh, no. No? <laughs> that would be something I would rent anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the Nagra 4, the portable uh, classic uh, machine, Nagra did sell, and I, I'm guessing they probably don't sell anymore, the uh, head alignment tool, you can see it over the record head now, uh, that looks like this. And I just wrote on Sharpie what it is. 
but you can see it's uh, it's a hang over the top thing and they've apparently determined the reference plane here is good enough on this little sheet of aluminum where the heads are mounted and it hangs over the top and has a precision milled blade that goes in front of the heads and has little cutouts slick for uh, the center and the tops and bottoms of, of uh, each track and you can shine a little light back there and you can see if uh, your head is straight true and at the right height cool I don't remember what I paid for this thing umpteen years ago but uh, anyone seen them on eBay recently it's especially important with uh, the pilotone head getting it right where you want it yeah well it's got the little milled slot right in the middle slick yeah never seen one of those never seen one aha uh -huh. so let's, let's let's i looked at the nagra t now i don't have one of these but they were pretty popular so someone asked me can i use the nagra 4 head alignment tool for the nagra t and the answer i think is pretty much no the head assembly is totally different even if the heads may be the same or something like that plus some of the mounting is probably about the same but I noticed that if you look in the Nagra T service uh, literature, they have this giant aluminum, it looks like aluminum wing, and a bunch of measurement tools. And I'm guessing they probably rented it, maybe? Or maybe only service centers had them? Or maybe only the factory has one? I don't know. But you stick this thing on top of your Nagra T, and uh, you've got... Uh, precision what look, looks like precision milled height things that rest on little uh, spots on the deck plate of the Nagra T and uh, I've, I've just skipped all the words I just have all the pictures here and I don't know if you have to supply your own dial gauge or, or not but they have these little jigs and tools and they said that's how you're supposed to do all the guides and heights on your Nagra T by having this giant plane here which makes total sense if you could ever find one of these things. The theory Fletcher. probably was if you could afford the Nagra T, you could afford the yeah, tooling. Yeah, I don't know. Does John French have one of these? Nope. So he's probably developed an alternate method. John does everything with optical comparators. Right. Yeah. I, I can imagine that. I, I just have to get like big magnifying glasses and stuff like that. No, his optical comparators. And I think the, when I was there 15 years ago, he had like five of them. Uh -huh. And you, you could see uh, one mil resolution as, as he cranked things up and down and, and just amazing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not in that bracket. So let's look at the uh, uh, the Ravox. Is, is this a Ravox or is it a Studer? It's an AA10 Studer. Yeah, that man is right. The Studer AA10. So you look through that service manual and Studer says, we'll take out the head block, put it on a uh, surface plate and, or a glass block if, uh, if it's an emergency, and we'll sell you this special tool and you can see, boy, that looks pretty similar to that Nagra thing. It's, uh, you know, it's got a, a mounting plate and a precision milled, we assume, blade on the front that you put right up to the heads, which checks exactly the height and squareness. Not the azimuth or the wrap, but um, anyone, everyone got one of these tools? I suppose you need, to, you need one of those tools for every different machine you work on. If they sell um, them. Roger Ginsley has a set, I believe, here in Toronto. <laughs> but all the Studer stuff is all the same height, all the different models. Oh, okay. Do you happen to know what that height is, Alan? Uh, I have it written down somewhere. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, I would just have to put it on the surface plate and measure the guides and, and say, well, I wonder if they picked an even number or not. No, yeah, it's not an even number. It's, yeah, it's some other number, yeah, anyway. And uh, they have uh, different uh, gauge blocks that you use it with to uh, on different machines and such. Right. Hey, can okay. something like that be three D printed? If you can get the uh, resolution, I have no idea. I mean, certainly it could be made in a good machine shop. Yeah, I don't think that 
anything you could 3D print would, would probably be accurate enough or hold its accuracy dimensionally. No? Depends on how much money you want to spend on the 3D printing, but yeah. if you're going to 3D Plus. print it out of metal, I think it would be cheaper to go to the machine shop and start with a block of metal. Yeah. Well, I, I think I'm going to be metal or could it be that stuff they make tone arms out of? I don't know. I have no I, idea what the, as long the as thermal it's stability is. So I, I, I'm not on the Ampex list anymore. One time, there was a giant argument about railroad trains or locomotives or something like that. And it, it lasted so long. I said, well, maybe I won't, won't get this digest now. And maybe I'll come back here. I'll have to phone up uh, Howard or something like that. But I did see the article. I think Denton Fast gave this to me eventually about using gauge blocks, uh, in this case on the AG 440 from, uh, Kurt Gresky. And, uh, it made total sense to me, except that I think he puts the gauge blocks on top of the brushed stainless uh, beauty plate on top of the 440, just because it's so hard to take the beauty plate off. Uh, but I did go out and get my own uh, gauge block set up, and uh, I, I believe most of you guys are familiar with gauge blocks, and I was not expecting uh, the audience to know anything about gauge blocks. So, uh, you know, common machinist thing, you, you have these steel blocks that are precision uh, manufactured in a range of sizes, so you can pick and choose them and uh, build up any uh, size uh, you need and uh, keep a little oil on them and you press them together firmly and swing them around a little and they stick together. I'm not sure if everyone has agreed exactly what the mechanism of these things sticking together is. You would think it would be obvious, maybe, but I, I've heard there's still some uh, arguments about that. Anyway, I bought this cheap set, and I think when I bought it, it was probably a hundred bucks. The economy to uh, grade B set, and you know, I looked at that certificate of calibration up there done in China, and according to them, the worst block in this set is 37 millionths of an inch off. And I don't know if you can believe that, but I figured at any rate, it's probably close enough for tape recorders. And in my case, uh, one of the things that came through my place here was this uh, MTR-10. And what I had shown previously in the show and tell was that the users of it had uh, put about 10 sticky shed tapes on them and run them all day. And the thing was completely clogged, so I had to take it apart to clean it anyway. And then when I do that now, I, I, I check it on the surface plate. So I was going to show the people the difference uh, after it's been cleaned and exactly where the heads are on this stuff. So that's why I have all these shots. And I told them you can just take the head block off. And on this machine, it appears to me that the guides are stuck to the surface plate, which is uh, uh, sheet metal sheet aluminum looks like and it's underneath these beige uh, beauty plates so those appear to be brown ceramic uh, tape guides on this with steel uh, uppers and lowers and they they seem to have a nice even number dimension on there and that's what the head block uh, screws to in this case so I uh, just took some quick measurements and uh, said well that's what I got we got two of them that's about all I can compare and I can at least make them all the same. And they look pretty close. You know, it hasn't fallen off a truck. And uh, I had this photo that I found on the internet to show the thing with that, the beauty plates removed, those beige plates. So it's just sheet aluminum. It's not a die casting. But I'm guessing they screw all the guides to this. I'm guessing you have to call that the reference plane. So I got my surface plate from Grizzly uh, Tools, and for, well, I'm, I'm afraid everyone here knows what the heck a surface plate is, but I was not expecting that, so I was going to say... It's Tell it to of, me, Gary. Tell it to the ignorant person. It's here. Uh, uh, Every machine shop has uh, the need to have a, a perfectly flat reference plane to do all your measurements. So this, you buy these hunks of granite or uh, 
they have some in steel, I guess, but the, the temperature coefficient's different. And some people just like the granite. And they're carefully finished so that uh, they have a very small variation in the surface. And you can refinish them. You know, they, they, you can call a guy in or send it, if it's small, send it somewhere. But <laughs> since uh, any modestly sized granite surface plate weighs hundreds of pounds, it usually costs more to ship than it's worth. Um, so this is my uh, uh, reference surface plane. Uh, is this granite surface plate. And uh, uh, I was showing the gauge blocks that I'd picked to make the height that I had measured for uh, the mounts for this uh, MTR-10. And because it has a circuit board uh, edge card connector on the back, you can't just set it down on the same spots. So I have these steel blocks the ones with all the holes drilled into them are known in the machine shop as one, two, three blocks. They're exactly one inch by two inch by three inches, and they are supposed to be guaranteed to be uh, uh, perpendicular and true and uh, flat. And of course, as you pay more money, you get a little closer tolerances, and these are cheap. I think these are like 20 bucks a pair, but according to them, you know, they're like, ten thousandth of an inch accuracy or something like that seemed good enough to me so I'm resting this head block on the surface plate and uh, on the one two three blocks and uh, my handwritten diagram had the numbers that I came up with and I got the equivalent number of uh, uh, gauge blocks out of my gauge block set and built it up to the same height and I have, uh, in this case, the little check bar from the cassette deck plate because it's just under a quarter of an inch. I suspect they did that on purpose here. Or I could have gotten the quarter inch uh, gauge block thing. And here's my Harbor Freight uh, calipers. And I was going for 1.257 inches. So according to this, I'm pretty close. I was also going to tell people to ignore the oil stains on the granite. It does no harm, and uh, you can use a little alcohol to clean that up a little bit if you want. Otherwise, you just leave it. And uh, with a little magnification and uh, some judicious lighting, I just use the gauge blocks here to uh, check the trueness of everything touching the tape. which seems relatively easy, but I do not have an optical comparator or a giant mantis uh, television microscope or something like that to actually see that close. So in a sense, I guess that's, that's one of the big limitations of my accuracy. Well, I mean, I've watched John Finch set Zenith on heads, and he does it with something that looks just about like what you're doing, and he just <laughs> eyeballs it because the comparator doesn't really help with that setup. John French doesn't just eyeballs it. Okay, I'm I'm happy. Uh, so uh, another thing is uh, some parts can be checked with a uh, stock off-the-shelf uh, angle. Uh, this is one I think it was made in Czechoslovakia or something. I was buying cheap ones, but they said, oh, well, it's probably good enough for tape heads, you know. And uh, trying to get some photographs, you can see the little teeny light gap because I put a little bright card behind there and shown some light on there to try to just check that the head is indeed true. And then as you push it up to the head uh, carefully, I guess, so you don't scratch it. Or you can put a little piece of tape on there, I guess, on the tape head, adhesive tape. I don't know. Uh, and uh, I did it on my APR. So... APR uh, Sony used to sell you uh, a little gauge block, which probably you can't get anymore, I'm assuming. If anyone knows of the dimensions of the little real motor height gauge block, I'd certainly be interested in having that uh, as a way to set the, the real table height. So I'm guessing they figure that the real motor mounting plate is uh, true enough to the reference plane that you can use their little gauge block and set the real table height. And I think Denton Fast pointed out to me once that they're actually measuring to the top of the rubber pad, which could vary a little bit. But, you know, that's where the reel sits, I guess. So 
I found that there's enough variability in the different kinds of reels out there that you just got to set it to fit anyway. Yeah. Okay. So here's the APR with the head block removed and the, the beauty plate taken off. So the arrows are pointing to the three uh, bosses that the head block sits on. Uh, and these bosses appear to be bolted into the casting little uh, islands or uh, in the casting that I'm assuming are precision milled uh, to a reference. And if anyone else wanted to know uh, ceramic capstan uh, in a, a motor and the other roller guides. So uh, I used my gauge box to set this uh, APR head block on the reference uh, plate by setting it right on the little bosses that uh, that it sits on. So uh, I admit that the gauge blocks are not certified in this dimension. I just picked three, but I measured them and they are, are all within, you know, less than a thousandth of an inch, the same height at this point. So, hey Gary. Uh, yeah. What is the uh, dip switches for in that head block? Uh, ask Richard Hess. <laughs> okay, Richard. Uh, the dip switches, there's a whole bunch of functions, but basically they allow you to give each block a serial number and you can have 12 different head assemblies for each machine with the settings for that head assembly stored in the machine. One of the switches selects whether it's a three and three quarter to 15 assembly or a seven and a half 30. And it also adjusts some of the, some of the settings are for half inch tape and some are for quarter inch tape. So it, it sets, uh, allegedly sets different parameters for the, uh, 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 for the real motors or the, the, the spooling system. Yeah. So it, it sets a personality for the head block. Yeah. So the machine recognizes it. So you have less effort to do when you change head blocks like zero effort yeah <laughs> a great idea uh, that's one of the things that why i think that's probably the major difference between that and every just about every other machine which is why i love them so much yeah you can see uh, at the uh, guides fastened to the top of the head block at the far top left and uh, to the middle right uh, that there's a couple of little different colored plastic shims underneath those guides. And uh, uh, I'm not sure why they use plastic. It, it sure looks like plastic and, and several of them. So I'm assuming they, they, uh, they're going for a magic height for those guides. I and think all, they're a mylar type thing. Oh, okay. All I could do was measure my one example and I got some numbers and uh, I just checked that the rest of the heads seem to agree with those guides because I've never touched the guides. I have to kind of assume that they're at the right height or where they wanted them. And they're close enough based on the rest of the uh, mechanism on the, the, on the machine. So, so I just go with that. Build hey, up Gary, the same thing. Yeah. Before you move on, I have a question about the gauge block display a couple slides ago. You have yep. three gauge blocks, but no, 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 too many, too many go back, just a couple back from where you were. Back or forward? Uh, back. So forward from here, but whoops. go back to where you, you were before I butted in. There, whoop. Uh, well, go forward some more, sorry. Whoops, more. Up backwards, sorry. There you go, right there. Yeah. So you've got three gauge blocks there, right? Yep. And I'm seeing a nine something on this one and an eight something, eight fifty something. Yeah. On the right hand one. And so the gauge block set does not come with three of exactly the same, but this is close enough. Yeah, the three blocks that you see, the the dimensions listed, one's point nine oh oh. Yeah. That is the long dimension where it's certified. Uh, 
Ah, okay, it, got it's, it. It's not actually certified in, in the direction I'm using it to just rest this head block on. Yes. But I measured it, and they all look like they came from the same stock. <laughs> so I, I, you know, you could run out and just buy three certified gauge blocks of exactly the right height. Right. But This is close I, enough. Okay, thanks. Is, I, I think close enough, yeah. Curious about the gauge block set. Fortunately, the connector clears the gauge blocks in this situation. Yeah, and I figured you also cannot put the head block upside down on the surface plate because this the thick top block is not actually completely parallel. Or at least mine isn't. No, it's... Um, there are... Well, actually, there are different versions of the top block. Okay. So this one's a casting. You can see that there's a lot of material removed. Yeah. And oh. then there are others which I don't know if I have one handy, uh, that are solid, more solid. Let's see, are we spotlit for uh, here? Yeah. Rich? Yep. Okay, this, this one is a, a solid sheet of aluminum. And then this one is the later cast version. Ah, yeah. So that it's never intended. the The reference plane is always the those three, those three bosses that you see, with right. the screws screws hanging out of them. And uh, strangely enough, they do not do not appear milled to me. What these? The bosses. No, not these. the The ones on the deck plate are that they that they reference down to. Which ones are they? Somewhere's. I'm not sure which. Well, let's see. Is it? <laughs> it's. You're dropping the, below the screen here. These, sorry, these two and one of these two. Yeah. So those, those, these are cl clearly milled. Even though this is like what thirty years old, yeah, it's still bright and shiny. Yeah. Well, it, it's aluminum, right? Aluminum alloy of some sort. Yeah. The, the familiar logo. It's a little out of focus there. Oh yeah, GRF. Yep. Hey, Gary. Yeah. So with the thing that you were using to verify the head height, that, that um, um, contraption you put together with the gauge blocks, yeah. is there a way to do that with a, les a laser thing? Do they make a little miniature laser? Um, oh, what do they call it? You know, like what you do if you're building a deck and you're setting your, um, your post levels. A laser level? Yeah. Do they make a miniature one of those? I have no idea. Because it seems like that would be ideal because you could you could just set it up with a precision ruler of some sort and, uh, you know, use it with any head. I don't know. <laughs> I have never seen one, Tom, in any of the the cheap tool catalogs I've looked through. Uh, and also the the size of the spot uh, would introduce some ambiguity, I fear. If the, if the spot was going to be visible. That's true. You'd need a very, a very little, it would have to be very miniaturized from what you do a deck with. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah the gauge blocks seem pretty bulletproof to me. Uh, the problem with the laser is you'd have to have some way to set it at different calibrated heights without going nuts. Although I suppose if you had gauge blocks sitting under the laser level, you could always just set it on different sets of gauge blocks. But no, I've then never seen such a thing. You just as soon use uh, Gary's contraption at that point. Then that's what I'd say. So uh, easy enough to 
to uh, use the built-up gauge blocks and uh, check the uh, squareness, trueness, and height of uh, all of these items. And uh, this is from uh, one of the versions, at least, of the APR 5000 service manual. And with their MCI heritage, they will sell you a parallel block. And uh, they appear to give directions for setting the... Uh, the zenith of the erase head by comparing it to the guide. So I'm not sure why I would bother with this with the surface plate rather than just doing them all individually compared to the surface. Um, because it's a lot less, uh, it's a lot less stuff to have in the field when you're checking the machine because the APR is wonderfully adjustable uh, there's no, nothing is fixed. They're all, they're all screw holes. Yeah. And, and um, so this is something you could do. I have used that method comparing to the fast guide and then rolling down the heads and then going and, and after I get to the last head, checking it to the, the next fast guide. And I think I've done pretty well with the, uh, the Zenith. Uh huh. Field. Yeah. In the field, especially. Well, yeah, I mean, this this is sort of the field here. It's not a lab. <laughs> and for yucks, I had an old machine. Uh, turns out the head block did come off. And in those uh, in that at that time, I had a smaller surface plate, so uh, my one, two, three blocks hang off the edge a little bit. But uh, unless there's a huge lip or something on the surface plate, it should be uh, fine. It uh, didn't really display any any uh, uh, rocking or anything. And uh, there's a giant bolt threaded into the one, two, three blocks on the left to hold the uh, the head mount plate down tight. And I uh, did the same thing. He wanted a little Nortronics head stuck in there. Didn't fast. This is Phil's machine, of course. I recognize it. I'm suppressing the memories. Yeah, yeah. And the, the guides pop in and out as, uh, for tape lifters. So they're double duty and they consequently they flop around a lot. So uh, not super accurate there. And uh, yeah, hey, again. What machine I, is this? Pardon? What machine is this? Uh, this is, uh, whoops. Presto. Yeah, it's ah. one of these. Okay. All right. Presto 8 something, 800 series, of course, yeah. I'm going to okay. bug off for a while and have dinner with my wife and see where you are uh, in 45 minutes or so. Well, I'll be done by then. We'll be in John Chester territory, but. Uh, well, I, I'd, I'd like to have? talk about. I'd like to talk about lubricant. That's, or, I'm sorry, cleaning agent. Yeah. That's Great. Have a good dinner. Okay. Yeah. And Gary, what are the, on these surface plates? What are the various sizes of them, and how much do they weigh? Well, uh, the ones uh, I'm looking at that are traditionally made of uh, granite, natural yeah. granite. So, how much does a granite rock weigh if it's? Yeah. Two inches by nine inches by 12 inches. Well, yeah, it's like 30 pounds or something like that. But you can buy them in pretty large sizes, like three feet by two feet and four inches thick. What's your big one size? And My big one, one is nine by 12. Okay. And this, uh, this one, this one is, I think, six by eight. Mm -hmm. They're also okay, great to put sandpaper on, and you have a nice flat sanding surface. <laughs> Apparently, if you want to, if you make guitars or something, they want a, you know, flat piece of sandpaper. Right. Uh, great door stops too. Where was I? Oh, uh, yeah. It's a little again. hard to move when you want to open the door, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. Paperweights. Um, Again, I uh, just put a little white card back there. I'm trying to shine the light in there, and that's what I look at with some magnifying lenses. Uh, tip the head up and down and back until it matches up with uh, with the check bar. So uh, I uh, just uh, t 
take random measurements of stuff that passes through my hands, and I have no idea of what the factory says to do, but, you know, if it passes through my hands, I try to take a little measurement of it. And uh, I don't know what John French does. I, <laughs> I guess he's got, he must have every tape machine uh, and a custom jig for it or something like that. So that that's what I got. All right. And any questions? More questions for Gary? Uh, Gary, this is Dave. I'm just looking at the MSC Direct website, which is a uh, source of tools. Oh yeah. And it, it looks like a uh, a granite inspection plate, what they call grade B, which is accurate to one ten thousandth, a twelve by twelve long and wide by three inches thick uh they give the weight uh here and uh let's see well i just lost the weight here but anyway uh that's like uh, 50 you, pounds or something it probably more than that the uh, nine by 12 by two is 30 pounds that feels so, about right yeah uh, yeah, MSC is among the more expensive. They're more expensive than Grizzly when Grizzly has them. And, of course, they're all made in China. M MSC has very good customer service. A lot of people in the machine shop business will go there to check on prices. So no affiliation. Right. <laughs> Any other interested. questions or comments for Gary? I'd, I'd be interested to hear what Steve Puntalulo is doing uh, now that he's free from uh, uh, Sonicraft. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. Uh, I'm doing some remixing. Um, <clears throat> cranked out a couple of, you know, music projects. Um, I turned the lab, uh, after everything moved out, I turned the lab, with the help of John Chester, by the way, um, with some pretty amazing help from John Chester, actually, you know, into a, a little project studio. So that's that's what I've been up to. Kind of you to ask. And that kind of brings us into the next part of our meeting, which is the introductions of everybody. So, Steve, where are you? Physically? Where am I? Yeah, where are you physically now? Oh, in, in the world, in, in the world, in the oh, world, uh, Freehold, New Jersey. All right. Okay. Thank you for joining us. This is the first time we've had you and a whole bunch of other people. So for, for this part here, we have people uh, introduce themselves and I'll call on you and give us a little bit of uh, a paragraph or so about what your audio connection is and Anything else you want to talk about for a paragraph or so? So Tom Stiles. Hey, Tom. Are you there? I am here. Am I All being right. heard? Yep. It's not seen? Yep, there, sort of. You're a little Stiles. phasey. It's in the car or something. Uh-oh. <laughs> However. We lost him. Am I, am I lost? Nope. Now you're now you're better. You're a little phasey sometimes, but go ahead. <laughs> or a lot phasey. I think you got that from John Chester. Yeah, Tom. Tom, I'm afraid you're. At, Tom, I'm afraid you're at the end of a long. Uh, wire or something and we're not really understanding you but uh it's good to know you're there he paints uh, styles let, yeah let's go to tom fine tom fine there you are don't hear you now there you go hey, guys. hey steve how are you man good buddy how are you all right Nice to see all these people from the Ampex list. This is like the brain trust of tape machines. So uh, yeah, Tom Fine, Brewster, New York, mastering and transfer engineer. And I do not do this level of maintenance on my tape machines, but it's always good to learn stuff from the experts. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, this is great. Um, I'm going to skip Rich because he's not there, I believe. Uh, so let's go to Ralph. 
I think you said you're in Australia. That's right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What time is it there? Um, let's see. Current time is just after 11 a.m. Oh, that isn't bad. Oh, not too bad at all. All right. Welcome. Tell us you. uh, about yourself a little, your audio connection. I'm a professional engineer, like electronics engineer, um, working in the IoT, you know, Internet of Things space. Um, audio was where I started my career, had trouble with it. Australia is quite a small audio industry. Um, became a professional engineer at that time. Been doing that for 20 odd years, but still maintained an interest in audio as well. And recently, in the last 10 years or so, I started working on uh, vintage audio restoration projects, um, a few tape machines included. So I'm very interested in learning about the uh, gauge blocks and the alignment because that's something that I've typically struggled with. The Ampex group has been very helpful on a couple of occasions with uh, questions I've had, but always keen to get more um, knowledge from the experts. As we all are. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, Matthew uh, Lutens. Hi there, I'm uh, Matt Lutens. I know some of the guys in here for, I've known them for 30, 40 years, long time, not 40, I guess, but 30 years anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Used to be out in the Seattle area. I still have a home there, but uh, I work most of the time in Salina, Kansas for uh, Chad Cassum, Acoustic Sounds, Analog Productions and uh, run Doug Sachs's old studio, the Mastering Lab. It's been moved out here to Kansas and uh, cut records next door over there. And then I'm currently sitting in um, in, in uh, Blue Heaven Studios, which is where we do a lot of tape duplication. And we're actually going to have a recording in here on December 17th, the first one in a couple of years. So that'll be kind of All right. fun to do. Yeah. How many ATR 100s do you have back there? Well, in this room, I've got seven, and then I've got the ATR preview machine for disc cutting next door. That's one of only three of those in the world I have in the room next door. So eight total. Yeah. And cool. we have two, uh, two more restored machines from ATR coming soon. So. Did you get the remote control start running yet? Uh, Brian has not finished that yet. No, he keeps <laughs> saying he will, and I'm sure he will. <laughs> so <laughs> that'll be a nice feature because I get tired of making the run in here, you know, and I start at one end and just go through and push all the buttons and do it really oh, fast. So I got him all the connectors for that. So. Oh, very good. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. So cool. good to see all, all you guys. I mean, there are names here that I've been hearing for years and years, and it's good to put a, a voice and a face with the name. So thank you for being here. That's what's so great about this format and being able to not have to leave home to do it. it was really cool. And Matt, did uh, somebody talk to me about uh, wanting to get some gear to you or something? Maybe? Yeah, did, and, did and he, he, yes, he emailed okay, me good. today. And so we're trying to work something Great. out. So yeah, okay, thank cool. You. Thanks for doing yeah. that. Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, I'm going to go to Goran, who says he wrote in the chat, no mic or camera here. It's late, one ten in the morning. And Goran, if you want to type a little more into the chat of, the, of what you would say if you were able to talk to the group, tell us where you are and what you're up to, I'll be happy to read it. Uh, but for now, let's go to Jerry. Where are you and what are you up to? Uh-oh. We'll come back to Jerry. Uh, Graham. Is that better? Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. That's That works. So I'm currently um, living sort of in the hills up above Silicon Valley, California. Um, originally, I was from Seattle. Uh, spent a lot of time with uh, hanging around, as a lot of you guys did, with uh, the University of Washington Music Department and tutelage of Glenn White. Um, other uh, other mentors in Seattle would be uh, Rick Chin and no less Gary Louie. Uh, left there after being the initial sound man in the brand new Meany Theater. Uh, I moved to Santa Monica to work for Vanna Clausen and Associates, who was the acoustician at Meany and the old Seattle Opera House. Uh, my first job there was to sit down uh, with the former, former audio consultant uh, for two weeks to learn what he had to tell me about. His name was Dean Jensen. And... Uh, <laughs> Needless to say, I learned quite a bit in those two weeks. 
<laughs> uh, the um, the job there turned out to be impossible. Uh, so I left there, did a couple little side jobs in, in Hollywood. And uh, Dean recommended me for a job at Capitol Records, where I was for the next five years uh, running the maintenance shop there. Uh, and that's three, three studios and three disc cutting rooms and six edit and mix rooms, as it's now quite famous, I guess. Uh, I left there after a management change, did some consulting for a while and moved up here. Uh, and now for the last 30 years, I've been working for one of the founders of Apple named Mike Markula. He and Jobs and Wozniak were the three originals. And working on his estate in Woodside, um, spending a lot of time in a theater that was designed and, and uh, implemented by two guys named uh, John Chester and Chris, and Chris Langhart. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, a lot of that stuff is still running, although it was never really heavily used. But we maintain it, keep, keep it going, and I'm about ready to retire from that. Cool. Jerry, you had said so many things that would be wonderful to hear more about. And we, Glenn White has come up a bunch in our discussions. And I would love to just have a round robin talk about Glenn White memories sometime. And I don't know if that would be attractive to you, but I would love sure. doing that. Because sure. he was big, he was big in my life too. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so thanks. Good to see you. You too. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Graham. Where are you and what are you up to? Well, I'm in Toronto, Canada. And uh, what with uh, health issues and so on, I'm really not getting very much done. I, I may get an hour or two here and there. And um, uh, it, yeah, it, things are moving in the right direction, although a lot more slowly than I would like. But uh, I've got a lot of things to do, and it's a case of trying to decide which of the things are the more important to spend the time on. So that's effectively uh, what I'm up to at this point. So. I'm I'm sort of I guess uh, an observer mostly at this point. Well, it's good to see you, and you're looking well. Thank you. All right. Um, before we move on, Steve, would you mute your microphone, please? You're jumping in once in a while. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dom, are you able to talk to us? You have a microphone there, but uh, it's off, and I don't think we've heard from you yet. Is that working? Uh, there you, you go. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Hi, gents. Where um, are you and what are you up to? I'm in the most uh, isolated capital city in the world. Well, that's what we like to call it. I'm in Perth, Western Australia. All right. Um, I feel very honored to be included. So thank you very much. I, I'm a studio guy. Uh, probably haven't been doing it as long as you guys. I'm only 56. Um, I have a, a studio in an old Masonic temple. I think you guys call them. We say Freemasons here. Um, lots of vintage gear, lots of tape machines, which unfortunately I don't get to use much anymore because it's just the nature of the industry and clients can't really afford the tape. It's pretty expensive down here. I think a roll runs around $440 or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, but I still have my tape machines, mostly Ampex. I have some Studers as well, but mostly digital these days, but I still run a heck of a lot of analog gear I've been collecting since 1975. So plenty of mics. I've got a couple of Neve consoles and all the good stuff. Um, that's about it really. Been, been slogging at it for years like all of us uh, <laughs> yeah there's a map. right there there you go perth wave to us 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, heck of a long way away. And extremely isolated from the rest of the world. We've been extremely lucky with, uh, with COVID down here. We've Good. hardly had any impact. Our borders have been shut for a long time. We, we have a premier, which is, I don't know, it's kind of like a, a state senator who keeps our borders shut. He's pretty hardcore, which has been awesome for us. We're lucky. Um, that's about it, really. Thanks for including me. I really appreciate it. We're glad you joined us. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I'm going to read Goran's, what Goran wrote there. Thanks to Gary Louie. Interesting. I'm in Sweden servicing tape machines for 50 years using the MCI gauge block since 1976. Indispensable doing on location service. Great. And type in anything else if you want to make a longer paragraph. And while we're at it, let's read Tom Fine's comment. How did you all international guys find out about this? Probably from the Ampex list, right? Did anybody find out about it some other way? John posted something, I guess, on the Ampex list. And that was how I did. It yes. Okay. Yeah, this turned Tom wrote this turned into a tape machine brain trust. Too bad John French doesn't zoom. Yeah, this is really great. I don't know much about tape machines, but I know a lot about people and there's a lot of really cool people here. So thank you. And somebody, oh, Chris Myring wrote uh, from the AES and the Ampex list, also the late lamented Studer list. So there's still a Studer list? I don't think so. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna let you guys read the rest no, of his no Studer chat. list. Yeah, no I, I think I, I used to run a Studer list, um, but um, passed it off, uh, I think, to Richard Hess, actually. Yeah, I think Rich... Uh, it's the Group I.O. list. The, uh, the Group I.O. list pretty much now welcomes Sony MCI, Studer, and Otari Professional. Yeah, I, I think so. he uh, rolled it all in together. Okay, and Chris also wrote, he'll have to get a camera and mic. Yeah, this is really great to be able to communicate around the world instantaneously for all intents and purposes. Um, this is the 63rd of these uh, tea time things that we've done, and it's just fantastic getting to know people. So, uh, yeah, definitely get a camera and mic and so you can contribute and uh, be appreciated. And he also said, my friend and colleague, Les Lambert, would want me to send greetings to Chris Langert and John Chester. And Chris left already, I think. Well, I'm still here. Are you? Okay, good. Okay. Good. I have no idea where Les is. I haven't touched base with him since the Rainbow and, and some of the Jumping Jack tours in England for many years ago. All right, and Chris also wrote, Chris uh, uh, Myring wrote, uh, it was Fred Ty's Tall's list. Yep. Okay. He was running the original studio list. Okay, great. Uh, Let's go to uh, Dave Dintenfoss. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah. I'm Dave. I living here in Seattle. I've been in Seattle since 86. Uh, born in New Jersey and moved to Chicago area when I was eight. Um, my earliest experience with Ampex were, uh, was buying the uh, parts from the dual capstan consumer machines over the counter on Lunt Avenue in Elk Grove Village when they stopped making the machines in 1974. A bunch of us in high school kids uh, heard about it, went over there and slipped some guys some cash and uh, they actually wrote a receipt. And we built six or seven of those awful dual capstan machines. They weren't so awful at the time, but... Um, then in uh, I was at school, University of Illinois, and worked at the radio station there um, as a board operator, and uh, got to play with the machines, uh, old 350s that were had Innovonics electronics, most of them. In '86, I bought a 351 mono machine out of the want ads, the little nickel want ads, when I was living in Boston. And of course, had to learn how to repair it, so that started the adventure. In recent years, I've had this little hobby business called Full Track Productions. And uh, one of my hobbies is having pinch wheels made. So here's a replacement pinch wheel 
for the original uh, Ampex uh, pressure idler. I have about 40 or 50 of these in stock. So if you're interested and you need them and they're nice, soft, fresh rubber, you can go to my website, fulltrackproductions.com and have a look around. In a former life, I was a technical writer. So one of my obsessions is writing up service notes. If you have any suggestions, uh, let me know. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, oh, uh, Bob Smith. Okay, well, uh, I'm sort of the, uh, the intended audience that Gary had because most of the stuff he presented is the first time I've ever seen any of that. I think the only time I've ever touched tape was cassette decks about 20 years ago. In fact, I still have a couple cassette decks behind me here. Um, in, in my life, I'm actually an acoustic researcher for a major medical device company. And uh, I don't know if you can see the... Um, we see the, a, a box. That's okay, somewhere. that's a Life Pack 15. That's what uh, uh, paramedics carry when they've been called, when 911 has been called and they've been activated, they bring this box out. It's a defib, it's a monitor, it has all kinds of parameters. It has all the parameters, bio, uh, biometrical uh, parameters and measurements that you could make in a hospital, all to a patient. It also has audio. That's the connection to the audio. This little, where, where my, uh, I don't know if you see a, a mouse pointer or not, but no. there's, a, there's a grill. Uh, there's a big black dial on one side. On the other side, down towards the bottom, there's a grill there, and there's a little speaker in behind side. that. Yep. Yep. And uh, and I'm responsible for the audio that comes out of that thing, uh, applying psychoacoustic principles to make that audio uh, more intelligible and uh, to achieve being audible in a noisier environment with the psychoacoustic process than without. And also these things record audio, so they... They want it to record like you've got a boom pole operator there uh, running into really nice equipment, except our budget is usually around $10 for everything, including the mic and it's a, it, uh, how it's going to be ma uh, mounted to the box. And it's about the same, 5 to $10 for the sound system going out. And yet I'm supposed to make these things sound really wonderful. Uh, and I've been doing this for, oh, I don't know, 25 years, but I've been in the by uh, the uh, medical device business for almost half a century. So again, I'm not really part of this really cool group of people here that's been fun to listen and hear about things that are way over my pay grade in this topic area. And Bob, so, if I can you. elaborate a little on what you said, that gizmo there electrocutes people in a positive way. And oh yes, literally, and literally saves lives, and people's lives depend on being able to hear the instructions that it is giving to how to use this device that is somewhere. And Bob has taken that little one-inch speaker and made it audible in everything from casinos where everyone is at full roar to helicopters where it's at a full roar to to uh, military transport things. Uh, 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 vehicles and made it intelligible and clear in those kind of environments coming out of that one inch speaker or is it how is it one inch or is it half it's two it's a 50 millimeter driver in that one uh, okay. i'm sorry that one's got a 45 millimeter driver so okay. what's 50 millimeters that's uh, an inch. two inches uh okay. and and the other thing is we make aeds the automatic external defibrillators where that's even more so but one of the things that dan here helped me with was to prove a concept long ago because we don't just trust that our, um, I don't trust that it all works without testing it. So we built a facility first in my own residence here, which is somewhat behind me. And then <laughs> finally we built one at the, uh, over at the Redmond campus where we can replicate these environments that Dan was just describing, We've taken recording equipment out and recorded in all those areas from airlifts to uh, being on the freeway, uh, and ride-alongs uh, with paramedics, uh, you name it, ER, or we can replicate those environments on demand in a surround ambulance sound simulator, which is sort of like a personal theater, except all the levels are calibrated so we know exactly what sound levels we're achieving when we're testing the systems and making sure that they function correctly and that they're audible. And we test with 
human subjects to listen and make sure that you can actually hear it at the distances we wish them to be audible at. Of course, there's no, you know, this is a battery operated system. It can only go so loud. You can always overwhelm it. So if you're doing a resuscitation next to a 2000 horsepower uh, diesel engine, yeah, you're going to have to move closer to the, to the driver. It's going to be a, a, a tough challenge there. Anyway, that's probably more than you want to know about this topic. But it's pretty amazing, and uh, it's cool that you're doing that. All right, thanks, Bob. Thank you. Bob. I have to leave in a few minutes, too, but I really appreciate everybody's participation here, and thank you, Gary. Yeah, really. Okay, Bob Olson, where are you and what are you up to? Hi. Well, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, where I've been for... 20 years before that, I was in San Francisco for, I guess, 20 years. And before that, I was in Detroit, Michigan. Doing? Where I grew up. And Did I you started, work in Detroit? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I worked at Motown Records for seven years. The whole years. time? Seven? Cool. For, for seven years. Which years were those? 65 to 72. Awesome. <laughs> and then before that, I started in, our school had a radio drama class. So from the eighth through the 12th grade, I was studying radio drama and editing tape and doing all that kind of stuff. Cool. So with two two women from NBC were teaching it, who were among the many women who got fired from broadcasting after World War II. Right, wow. And you gave a talk to our section in February, was it? And it's online uh, yeah. at our website. And it was, a, it's a, it was a fantastic talk. I'll say that again. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I can't, I, and I'll start out with, I can't thank the people that are in medical electronics enough. Um, as some of you know, I was very sick uh, a year ago. This is me one year ago. I don't know if it'll show up, but. Oh yeah, in a hospital bed. It's, a million monitors and a million tubes and everything. So it's been one year since my heart transplant. So I'm getting things back up and running. I'm working on equipment. Uh, life is starting to be not normal, normal because I, it's you know it, it has its realities for me. I still have more battles to fight with, but uh, it's it's going well. We had a nice trip down to the coast over the weekend. So great. Yeah. So I spent That's 30 years or so uh, in broadcast. Um, doing uh, being a chief engineer at various radio stations, uh, FM and AM, <coughs> should be, and uh, st that's sort of where I got my feet into all of this stuff. And then, oh, around around 2000, so uh, all the changes coming into the industry, I said, I'm out of here, and I started working more and more uh, music industry people doing consulting, building studios, and, and, or as my wife says, what do you, what, when people ask me, well, what do you do? I say, what do you need? <laughs> I'm an old farm boy and I'm an old engineer. And uh, that's what I do is what do you need? I think John is uh, identifying with that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I've got tape machines in here that uh, people ask me to restore. I've got, uh, a uh, speaker system for uh, Bear Creek I'm working on right now for, for their bigs, uh, you know, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, that's what I do is what's, what's up next. And, uh, yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you for being with us in more yeah. ways than one. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Uh, thanks. John, where are you and what are you up to other than getting ready to talk to us in a few minutes? Uh, I'm in Cambridge, Maryland, and um, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, I've spent about the last, what, 
15, well, going on 15 years now working on tape machines. And uh, Steve was actually the one that got me back into that. And uh, trying to fix old tape machines and make, in some cases, make them work better. And then I ran into Jamie Howarth and started working on Plangent, which is a method of uh, recovering the bias from tape recordings and using that to remove a great deal of the wow and flutter. Uh, so I built the new generation of Plangent hardware and I do a lot of Plangent transfers. Um, that's the recent history. The old history goes back to 1968 and doing live sound and and about 15 years in the broadcast industry building equipment. Um, and since we're talking about tape machines, I do have a little sidelight on tape machines from last week. Uh, let me just share this here. Um, except that this covers up my Zoom. Uh, there we go. So there you go. There you go. Uh, put this in a sensible position here. Um, last week I was fixing MM twelve hundreds, and one of the MM twelve hundreds. The reason it doesn't work is it has a bad tack signal coming out of the capstan motor, and nobody we know knows how to fix this problem. So I took home one of the capstan motors, which had bad bearings in it figuring that if I ruin it, well, it was an educational experience. So that's how far you're normally supposed to get into a capstan motor. You take the back off and on the right, you see the, the brushes and the magnet assembly. This is actually the rotor of the motor. And the tachometer is buried up in the next section up that you're not supposed to take apart. So I took it apart, um, take off this plate, which is the other pole of the magnet assembly for the motor. And then you take off another plate and that is the magnet assembly for the tack. And I'll show you a close up of the tack. I've never actually seen one quite like this before. It has two gears and this part outside is stationary and the inside part rotates because it's attached to the motor shaft. And the magnetic field goes from this piece down here up into this plate, across through the gear, and then back down and into the back of this piece underneath here. And there's a coil of wire, which is wound around the metal shaft that had the magnetic field going through a piece of steel in the center of it. And that's the pickup coil on the tack. Um, so what it's sensing is the, the gear teeth getting closer together and further apart as the, the thing rotates. The thing I find interesting about this tack assembly is that it's basically averaging out the response all the way around the gear. So I imagine it's actually a great deal more stable than the ones that have a precision optical tack disc and a pickup that's mounted at one point on the disc. Because on those, as we'll see a, a bit later on in an ATR, um, you have to get the disc centered really, really accurately. Otherwise you have a a uh, flutter component, which is related to the rotation rate of the disc. And uh, I still don't know what's, this is a motor that is not the motor that had the tack problem. It's still mounted in the machine, but the next time I'm back there, I now know how to take it apart this far and I'm gonna try to figure out what's wrong with it and see if I can fix it. Because like so many tape machine parts, MM1200 capstan motors are 
getting a bit scarce these days. So that was one of last week's little uh, adventures. That was really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody got any ideas for him? No, but I was uh, I was warned. I, I love taking the stuff apart method of figuring out how it works, but I was warned to not do that with the Nagra 3 capstan motor unless you've got the magnetic shorting ring. That is a danger in many cases, but <laughs> on the MM1200 motor, uh, you are specifically instructed in the manual to take off that plate on the back that has the magnet on it because you have to periodically clean out the the uh, dust from the brushes wearing down so obviously they're not worried about it on that one i don't know why but i know that on many other motors you do have to have the appropriate shorting bar to ensure that you don't lose strength on the magnet when you take it apart cool anybody else Just an aside about shorting bars. Uh, Westrex disc cutting heads have got some uh, really heavy duty magnets uh, in them. And if you start thinking about taking one of those heads apart, you better have a good size shorting bar nearby because if you lose the uh, uh, the magnetism out of the head uh, <laughs> need, needless to say uh, you can't sort of uh, go to your local remagnetizer and have them uh, remagnetize the uh, assembly again so <laughs> you got to be careful with what you've got so the magnetism disappears if you don't short it, if you don't have a bar? Uh, apparently, it? the magnetism oh. uh, literally fades huh. to the point where uh, the functionality uh, of the cutting head is affected and you, you simply can't get the results from it uh, attempting to cut a lacquer that you would if the magnetic structure right. was in right. fact intact and functioning as it should. Yeah, because when it's assembled, it has a relatively closed magnetic circuit and there's a relatively high flux density in that circuit. When you interrupt that circuit and the flux density drops, it tends to lose magnetism permanently. Hmm. Okay. And quickly too. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, have my Nagra 3 uh, capstan motor shorting tube here. It's just a steel tube. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of machined out here in the corner. But yeah, if you pull the rotor out of a Nagra 3 capstan motor, you have to slide this up to it. And I guess what, into the into the motor to, to short the magnetic field so it doesn't die when you pull the rotor out? I assume that's correct, but I've never taken one of those motors apart myself. So. Neither have I. I inherited this shorting ring, and I've never needed or to take a Nagra three capstan motor apart. Hey, Gary, why does that it, work? It's in, it is in the man, It's in the manual. It's in the Nagra three manual. It says if you don't use it, um, you'll still have some residual magnetism, but the motor will not have enough torque to operate the machine correctly. Hmm. Hey, oh, why I does that work? In other words, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. Why does that shorting thing? Yeah. Work? How? What is this? I've never heard of this before. But being it an fools, English maker and all, it fools the the uh, uh, field into thinking that the armature is still in place, and it's, so it's just a substitute armature while the armature is removed. Is it the same as putting a bar across a U-shaped magnet, the ends of a U-shaped magnet, to keep the magnetism? Yeah, yeah they basically, call, yeah. They call them keepers. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And Chris Chris Myring wrote in the chat, MTR 92, 90-2 is a similar motor taking apart never seemed to make any difference. So this is similar to John's motor, I guess. Uh, although it always worried me, people burn out the disc by 
stalling with sti sticky tape. Discs now very scarce. Okay. Like so many other parts. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else before we move on on this? This was really interesting sidetrack, which I love about this <laughs> this format. Uh, oh, let's go to. Can I just ask about the magnetic shorting again? Yeah. So what? So I still don't understand this exactly. Is this is this is shorting a a permanent magnet? Yes, sounds like it. Yeah, and this is to prevent that magnet from losing magnetism. I didn't know that happened. Yep. Somehow that magnet is designed that if you don't do that, it will lose its magnetism. Apparently. Well, I don't know if it's. If, I don't know if "designed" is the right word, but one of the characteristics of the magnet, and frankly, an undesirable yeah. one, so I yes. hesitate to say it's designed that way. Well, right. If they could avoid it, they would. Right. But what happens is, as a result of the way the magnet is built, when you open the magnetic circuit and the flux density drops, it starts losing its permanent magnetism. Well said. And so you have to have a, a magnetic, a magnetically conductive object to put back across the open circuit that results when you remove part of the motor and keep the, the magnetic field at a high flux density. All right, I'm gonna email you so you can explain to me how, why it would lose its magnetism. I, I guess that's, a, that's something I didn't understand. Here, Gary's right. I'm not sure I can. Gary put this in. Here's the page from the Nagra 3 service manual. And uh, if you pull the rotor out, you got to put this thing in as you do that, or the magnetism will be reduced quite a bit. I can uh, reproduce this. We can make it available afterwards along with the transcript. So that's the second to last paragraph there. So the, this line at the bottom is interesting. Later dismantlings will not increase the amount of demagnetization. So it gets so there's some level that it drops to, and then that's it. Yeah, it loses yes. about 25% of its magnetism That's if you don't do this. what Nagra says, so. Yeah. All right. Anyway, but that's what they say. <laughs> Whether that varies with different types of magnets or not, I don't know. I never studied the issue closely enough to know the answer to that. It must, because there are magnets that don't demagnetize if you don't have something on it. Although I've never, how do you, I don't know how to measure a magnet. There is certainly our ways. Yep. There you go. Magnetometer. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we need and a John, TPT on magnetism. There you go. What is it? <laughs> How does it work? <laughs> it's magic. We're, we're stymied. Um, so John mentioned the Plangent meeting, and, and Chris Myring uh, mentioned that he learned about this at that, at, at about tea time at that meeting. And I should report that uh, there was, we recorded that and there were copyright uh, issues with it and I disputed it. And they have two more weeks, I think, to reply to my dispute. And I don't know what happens if they don't reply, uh, but on YouTube, there was a dispute. So that's why you've not seen a video of that yet. Did, oh. you, did, did, did YouTube, themselves dispute or no. was it somebody that made a complaint to youtube about uh what you had you, youtube clearly has something in its review process before you publish your video that people can check for copyright infringements on their own property so there were two from one from whoever owns uh, the Allman Brothers piece that was used in it, the Allman Brothers sample mm. that was used in it, and one from the Grateful Dead, whoever owns the Grateful Dead sample that were, was used in it. So there, it's not a strike against the cop against the video poster. It is a prohibition against monetizing that video and it allows the copyright holder to put in ads to our video and mm -hmm. since i would rather that my ads or that, that my videos not have ads because this is a non-commercial aes is a non-commercial thing 
Would it be possible for you to uh, remove the contested segments yes. and substitute something else? Yes, but the contested segments were what proved the efficacy of the plangent process. It was uh, 15 second or less samples of the screwed up tapes of wow in terms of wow and flutter uh, and 15 second or less samples of that same sample fixed by plangent. So removing it would kind of defeat the purpose of of having the re the listening reference, so well, I figured unless, what the hell I'm going to dispute you could it. Find, so. Unless you could find uh, something that had similar characteristics. Well, there plangent, are there plangent, are many other plangent, plangent yeah. processed them. Yeah, and, yeah. There, Graham. There are many other uh, examples in the in that video. That's a three and a half hour video. And there are many examples, and there were only two disputes. But I figure, what the hell? I, I want to know about this. And so I <clears throat> disputed it in as legally cogent way as I could. And we'll see what happens. It should yeah, be allowed under fair use. Uh, okay. I'll be very interested to hear what the results are uh, on that. Yeah. Yeah. It, Alan, you said that it should be fair use. It should be allowed under fair use, a 15 second sample. Yeah, it is yeah, not. And a that's what work. I argued. That's what I argued. And YouTube very helpfully has several links that tell you how, what constitutes fair use and not, and what are the four tests that the court uses based on some Supreme Court something decision. What are the four tests they use to determine if it's fair use or not? So I pitched my arguments to those four points. John, were you going to say something? Um, no, it I don't like think you so. were ready to pay. OK, sorry. Mm -hmm. It looked like you were ready to say something, and I was cutting you off. OK, Bob Smith, we'll see you later. Take care. See you next time. Uh, let's go to Chris Langert. Where, where are you, and what have you been up to? Uh, I don't know where my picture is. Can you hear me? We hear you just fine. Don't see a video. Oh, well, maybe the camera is turned off. Let me look camera around. is turned off, definitely. All right. Well, I've pushed the button. I don't Bingo. know whether it's happened or not. There you are. Hello. Oh, I don't see me, but whatever. Um, anyway, well, gee, uh, I stumbled into Syracuse University and met John, who lived in that town and moved on to NYU. And then the Fillmore opened next door. Uh, and then uh, a bunch of their students that were at NYU. NYU um, <clears throat> very cleverly started a new drama school from scratch. And their solution to the problem of collecting all the students was to put a poster up in all the drama schools around it said, you know, this is what's wrong with your drama school. And we know that and we can fix it. And everybody read the thing and said, you know, they're right. I should go there. And so all of a sudden, a whole bunch of really smart characters turned up. And uh, I have known many of them for quite a time. And uh, <clears throat> it's since that time, uh, the Fillmore East then opened up next door. And who's going to mess around with an eighth of a city block if you can have a quarter of a city block or half a city block and Janis Joplin every weekend? So it's... <laughs> Well, it's a slight exaggeration, but it was somewhat <laughs> interesting every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but you had some kind of entertainment every weekend, which was serious. Right. And we started with the sound system that we'd hired, and John <clears throat> worked it over and worked it over. And I was involved with a lot of the mechanical stuff because there had to be somebody to do that. So that ranged from providing counterweighted light pipes and screen supports and platforms for the light show and you know, all the way to reworking the air conditioner, uh, putting new tubes in its heat exchanger and ridiculous stuff. Um, then I went on to work at a scenic shop, <clears throat> IATSE, um, being in charge of estimating and designing stuff after the artists wave their hands at you. And um, after that, um, in Lambertville, New Jersey, I stumbled on towards working for the outfit that has subsequently made the art yard 
installation in Frenchtown. And uh, John came and did the acoustics in that auditorium. And I've had something to do with consulting the architect and trying to keep the thing from going off the road and here and there. And um, for about 20 some of those years, I was also teaching at Silbury School, which is a private high school near where I live and uh, dealing with their theater and working in maintenance and one thing and another. So I've been blessed to have something to do with audio, uh, having bumped into Hanley and um, otherwise, you know, still having to do with audio a little bit, not so much as with buildings and that sort of thing, but the whole mess taken together. And whoever it was that connected with Les Lambert with that message, I'd be pleased to have an address for where he could be discovered because I haven't seen him in ages. He was on some of the stuff we did at the Rainbow when the Fillmore closed, uh, John Morris initiated the Rainbow, which um, was a Fillmore-like situation until um, they made the misdecision that they should have a circus for Christmas because that's what the theaters in London do. And Frank Zappa got pushed off the stage by a energetic audience member. And the result of those two things together left you without any income for a couple of weeks or more. And oh. that's sort of what killed a place. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you. I, I, this brings up how- well, I left the Woodstock out of it, but- Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That kind of tags onto the tags onto the Woodstock, onto the Fillmore part. This brings up again how much I would love to hear more about all of these subjects from you and everybody else practically. So well, I'm not, you know, I don't have any detailed audio experience except, you know, just trying yeah, to Yeah, it doesn't have to be audio. We've already shown with with uh, Steve Lampin's baseball card collection that uh, our interests are wider than than strictly audio. So uh, anytime you want to talk about something, I would be happy to uh, have that happen. And, and other people too. We got nothing scheduled for next week, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris Myring wrote that Lee, Les is okay living in Colchester. And then I have to open chat to see that. Uh, oh, give me an email address. Okay, uh, there You've is, got uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to happen now. Don't take everybody's time up. Just whenever you Yeah, can. yeah. Chris, put in your email address for, for the other Chris to grab. That, that uh, wasn't quite an email address. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris is. Uh, let's go to Goran. Your, I think your audio was working there. Is that right? No, I think he said he has I don't no, think camera, so. no camera, no, no mic. So we well, can he, he kept jumping in, though. Uh, he kept jumping in, and uh, which is an audio cue, but maybe not. Okay, he says yes in the chat. One other aside, while I'm still able to be on the talking end here, okay. I had occasion to do a um, podcast with the with the collection of characters that were working on a Woodstock historical thing. And um, there were about five of us on it. And uh, John Morris was among those and, and is more or less historic in terms of being one of the announcers of the Woodstock and one thing, another. Mm -hmm. And his um, audio feed for the uh, Zoom call, which they were using to put this all together was particularly terrible. And mm. I wondered if anybody had any experience with um, separating out the different voices on a Zoom call. And, you know, I, I could think of several things I would love to have stuck his voice through at the moment. But now that it's over with, <laughs> up, I would really like to have a chance to fix it before they put it together in a podcast. Does someone have a recording of this that can be sent to, to one of us? I, I would say it's it's got to be possible. Yeah, I haven't I've got I've, I haven't got the person who's in charge of doing the, the 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 editing of the podcast yet, but I've got the other partner of the three of them who's sort of coordinating the whole thing. 
But uh, I just thought, you know, the most historically revered person of the whole bunch of us that was on it, uh, you can't understand him some of it, some of the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. It remains to be seen whether that's fixable or not. Sometimes it's not, but yeah, it's worth I bet a try. if you sent that, I bet if you sent that to John Chester, you'd be in the best hands possible. Oh, I would be in the best hands. I have to get it first before I dare to ask him. <laughs> yes. And the one thing that won't help you at all um, is that uh, it's possible as a Zoom host to set up your recordings so that the audio tracks is recorded in the number of tracks equals the number of people. So each person is on a track. Um, the, the standard Zoom recording is everything mixed into one batch of stuff. So you'd so have to switch it every time the speakers changed. No, no, you 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 get uh, you get a recording of the Zoom call with an audio track that's the same as this audio track that we're getting now. You also get the individual audio tracks if you set it up this way as a, as the host. You get the individual audio tracks for each person recorded separately. Really? So I don't know if it. it did that or not. Because Yeah, I that's the helpful. thing. That's why I say it's not going to be helpful to you now, probably, because it's not. But just FYI, if you're could ever on a Zoom call. Could have been done that way. Pardon uh, me? Well, they're continuing could have been interview. done, yeah. Yeah, they're continuing to interview other people from the, from the Woodstock era and have many more to go, although they've done several already. And uh, so we'll see what it is. But Great. I was disappointed that, 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 that there was that much difference between the different tracks. I was surprised. Yes, that happens. And and you included John Morris's email in something that you sent me. And I emailed him to ask if he would want to be part of this. But John says, John Chester says he's not in good shape these days. So maybe so yeah, that I think might he be was, difficult. Uh, he, they also uh, attempted to get a hold of him. And uh, he declined their offer to interview singly, but when I uh, was tapped to do their show, I said, I'd like to do it with John because there's a lot of shared information there. And he did volunteer, yes. so we had the both of us on. And yes. that made it a lot easier. Okay, great. For him Thank to you. Bounce back and forth. Yeah, thanks. And thanks again for being here. Uh, let's go to Gary. Yeah, you're still there. Me? I think I said everything at the beginning. Did you say all your stuff at the, at the start? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I said that I would say in my part here uh, something about this group. And I started it because I do live sound for concerts and stuff and uh, had no work during COVID for all intents and purposes and uh, wanted to keep busy on Saturdays because Saturday is a work day for me. So um, I started this group on Saturday to just talk about whatever we wanted to talk about. And it's been extremely gratifying, uh, as today is extremely gratifying, to have all these cool people together talking about stuff that they're interested in and showing off something that they're excited about. So uh, that's pretty much it, I guess. And I'm back to work now, which is why we are on Mondays because I've been working on Saturdays, which has been really great. And uh, doing a bunch of actual concerts with people who are focused on the music and uh, listening to what I put into the room and what I put into the monitors. And that's been really gratifying as well. And uh, in two weeks, we are gonna do a section meeting that is, uh, the, the main subject is some kind of audio for video games or something. Um, but the part that I am excited about is that it's going to be our first in-person, co combined in-person and online meeting. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about how to do that with Zoom and in, in a space with lots of people and how to get the people on Zoom to be equally part of the meeting rather than just watching it. Uh, and just like this, where you can chime in and, and the people in the room can chime in and the people on Zoom can chime in. And we're doing run-throughs. We had a run-through yesterday. And before that run-through, I had a full head of hair. But uh, 
there were a couple of extremely aggravating parts of my setup and uh, that was what I was focused on. But I realized today that there were several, several hundred parts of what I did that worked out great. So I'm working on the parts that didn't work and it's gonna be a real interesting phenomenon, I think. So if you wanna to come to it, follow that link and Gary, maybe you could put the link in the, in the chat uh, real quick like here and uh, show up to it. It's gonna be Sunday afternoon, the 21st. So Sunday at three, same time as today, whatever time it is at your time. It's going to be three, the same time, but on a Sunday, the 21st, and we'll go for as long as we want after the presentation about the sound for the video games. The place we're doing it turns out people who do sound for video games. So that's kind of a big thing there. Um, so let's go on to the next half of our meeting or however long, excuse me, it goes. And that's John and Tom and everybody talking about stuff. And we'll start with John, who has a, a bit of a presentation, I believe, and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks again, everybody. Yes, I do. And let me just get this queued up here. Uh, see if I can get to the right. No, I can't. Uh, so I have to get the video up first before I can share that window. And All while right. you're while you're doing that, uh, Chris Langert, uh, Chris Myring put his email in the chat for you. I want to be sure you right. see that. Yep. So let me get this back to the right place here. Uh, I have to go back to the beginning. There we go. Um, so this is specifically, the general subject is scrape flutter idlers. Uh, the ones that I am most familiar with and have available to demonstrate are Ampex scrape flutter idlers. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and it should be that one. Come on. <clears throat> Why when I select it and click share screen, does it not do it? A very patient audience that understands that computers will do whatever they will. <laughs> yes, I know. There we go. You're seeing it now? Yep. Oh, good. I see your whole desktop. Hmm? I'm, we're, we're seeing your whole desktop, it looks like, with a, a window of the picture. Well, let me see what happens big, when I do it's that. It's as big as it can get. There, so now we're seeing the picture and everything else is blacked out. So it's like a slideshow. And uh... Okay, so the first picture is an Ampex scrape flutter either from an ATR. And in order to take it apart, you have to undo those two set screws at the front. And so you need a 0.035 Allen wrench, which is smaller than available in a lot of sets. The other thing you have to do is you have to measure the height of the spool so that you can get it set back to the right place because there's nothing about this assembly that guarantees that it'll be set at the correct height. You have to adjust that. So now we're taking the set screws out and you push the spool up and down and the, the bearings, which are mounted in those two little brass pieces, move away and you can pull the spool out. And then you can pull the bearings out. We'll get a closer look at those bearings later. If you move your uh, cursor, we can get the control panel to disappear. 
There we go. Okay, so this one's pretty clean because I've serviced it fairly recently, but the first thing I always do when I take them apart is I take a Q-tip moistened in acetone and I clean off the ends of the spool and the shaft. Then I clean the bearings to remove the really gross dirt from it. And ones which have been taken apart that haven't been serviced in a long time are usually a great deal more dirty than these are. What are those bearings? Uh, are they just brass or? It's a brass tube and there's a synthetic ruby bearing which is set inside it. And we'll have a view in the microscope in a minute. So then we take the ultrasonic cleaner and some sort of degreasing solvent. That's my favorite. We put them in the ultrasonic cleaner. I run them for about eight minutes. And when they come out, I clean it again just to remove any cleaning solvent. And what gives you the, the, the notice that this thing is needing this cleaning? Does it drag on the tape or what is, what is the result that tells you that you need to do this? Um, if you read the manual, it says that you're supposed to do this once a year or every, I forget if it's a thousand or 2000 hours of operation. Um, I don't know anybody who does it that often, except maybe me. Um, but the, uh, we'll get into some measurements later that show how you detect this if you can measure your tape recorder. When they get really bad, they start making screeching noises, but they're, they're hopefully they're never gonna reach that point because by that time they're usually ruined and you can't resuscitate them. Who does that? Uh, so in a second, we're going to get to cleaning out the bearings. Thought I did that already. Just going to skip ahead a little bit here. Mm, ah, this is after they've come out of the ultrasonic cleaner, and that's a. Uh, squeeze bottle with a, uh, a blunt hypodermic tip on it, 22 gauge. And I give it a shot of acetone down inside the bearing. And that's to absorb any water because acetone and water mix very well. And acetone evaporates very quickly. So since I'm usually in a rush and want to put this back together again, I just stick some acetone in there blot it out and then leave these to dry for maybe 10 minutes and they're dry enough to continue with. So does the, uh, is the acetone bad for your squeeze bottle? Uh, I find that the squeeze bottle survives for a year anyway before I have to replace it. So if you have a good polyethylene squeeze bottle, um, I don't find that it causes much trouble. Uh, so here's a bearing. This is a microscope view straight down the center of the bearing. And there's about, I've seen at least half a dozen different versions of this, um, but basically it's a piece of synth synthetic ruby with a very precise hole board in it. And it's stuck in a hole in a brass tube. And here, is the shaft that goes into that hole. And this one is in pretty good condition. This one, on the other hand, a friend of mine bought this on eBay, advertised as being in excellent condition. And when he asked me if I sh he should buy it, I said, well, if they guarantee you can return it, buy it, we'll take it apart and have a look at it. And this is what I found when I took it apart. This is not promising. And that's one shaft that's in pretty good condition, but that's the other one. There's a close up of it. That unfortunately is suitable for only for the trash can. <laughs> totally dead. 
So that brown stuff we saw in the other picture was the shavings of that? That's all pieces of tape. Let's go back to that. Yeah, that's all stuff that fell right off there. the tape. Uh, okay, and that's tape. Got into and other pieces of dirt and anything that was floating around the tape machine just collects around the bearing and eventually it migrates up into the, you know, as the, the oil eventually is uh, evaporates and then this all migrates up onto the shaft and then the shaft wears down and after that it's dead. John, presumably uh, that brown stuff would be iron oxide, which would be abrasive. Yes, no. Um, I would imagine it's mostly iron oxide, yes. And yes, I suspect it is abrasive. So and hence, if you don't clean that off, you've got accelerated wear as you showed in the picture that uh, was for the trash can only. Yep, there it is. And you can see that it's actually reduced the diameter of the shaft noticeably. And uh, later on, we'll see not a shaft that bad, but what happens when you use one that's worn like that. Um, so then we have to lubricate it. My tool of choice is a toothpick. And the substance in the bottle, well, we can discuss lubricants in more detail a bit later on, but I experimented with a bunch of different lubricants and I'm not using the one recommended by Ampex. Um, this is a subject substance called tough oil, T-U-F-O-I-L. It's made as an engine additive. Uh, it's a fairly high viscosity synthetic oil, which is fortified with uh, nano size Teflon particles. And my tests show that it works very well on scrape flutter riders. So you take a tiny little bit on the toothpick. And, oh, come on, lost my place here. Uh, where's the rest of my video? Oh, pardon me for one second. Perhaps I started the wrong version of this. Uh, are you still seeing that? Just no, so you know. you've stopped screen share. Yeah. Okay, so I got to screen share this again. John, where do you get this puff oil? Uh, lots of places, including Amazon. Auto supply. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I've never bought it at an auto supply store. I've, you can either order it directly from them, or I bought it on Amazon. Um, Let's see if this works this time. Nope. It Let's me share the desktop. I have used it on drum winches involved with rigging situations. And if you pull on the drum switch hard enough, or on the drum worm gear of the drum hard enough, it will run backwards. It's <laughs> dangerously shippery. So do you see the screen now? Yes. yes. Small. Good. Though. Let's well, put this up where we see the, Yeah. now you should see the whole video. Yep. Good. Let's continue with the right version of this this time. Now here we are cleaning it out. There's the bearing, there's the bad shaft. Ah, so here we go. We're now in the right place. So in a second, we'll see two of the substances that I've experimented with. Uh, these are uh, synthetic oil and synthetic grease, also Teflon fortified, made by somebody who used to be part of DuPont. Supposedly very slippery stuff. And it's not bad. I found that the Teflon oil was better. 
And there's the tough oil. Engine treatment, <laughs> but it works. So here we are back at the toothpick, put some on the toothpick. And I do this under the microscope. I just apply a tiny, tiny quantity to the shaft on each end of the idler. And then I take the jewel bearing. I fit the jewel bearing onto the shaft so I get a little bit of oil inside the bearing. Same thing on the other end. John, do you need to keep track of which bearing goes on the top and the bottom of the shaft? I do. And um, when I was discussing this with John French, he said, oh, I always mark the bearings and the spool so I know which one was top and which one was bottom. Because he said that in the past, he had occasionally assembled them with the components in the opposite orientation and discovered that it didn't rotate as well. And neither he nor I has any explanation for why that should be the case. But ever since I heard that from him, I'm always careful to mark the top and the bottom and put it back the way I found it. So then I take a small lint-free cloth and I just gently blot the shaft to remove any large drops of oil which remain on the shaft. Don't scrub it, just blot it a little bit. And I haven't really discussed putting it back together. I haven't shot putting it back together again, but it's basically the reverse of the disassembly procedure. Um, I have measured the distance from the bottom to the bottom of the spool and set it to the number that I measured originally. And then the tricky part of this is getting the top bearing set in the right place because you want maybe a thousandth or two thousandths of an inch of vertical play. And if you push the top bearing all the way down and tighten the set screw, then it won't rotate freely. And so it's the trickiest adjustment, really. You just have to try it a couple times and carefully try to push the top bearing up by a thousand through two thousandths and tighten the set screw and see if you got it in the right place. And in this case, I've marked a black bar with a Sharpie around one side so you can see it rotate. When you get it right, you spin it with your finger and it should spin for about that long. So that's the end of the video. Now, Let's find the next bit here. And that's here. Uh, so this is a wideband flutter measurement. Um, I like to measure flutter out to five kilohertz. And in this case, we're not seeing the whole graph because the scrape flutter either doesn't have much effect on what happens below a couple hundred hertz. So on the left, we have, this is an ATR with the scrape flutter either removed. And there's the scrape flutter. And this shows you that putting the scrape flutter either in is definitely a trade-off because this is an old scrape flutter idler. It's not in terrible condition, probably typical of what's in many machines these days. And you can see the scrape flutter up here is pretty much gone. But the trade-off is that this area from a couple hundred Hertz up to maybe 2K has all this stuff that didn't used to be there. So, it's not as bad as the scrape flutter was originally, but 
when I see one that's this bad, I like to replace the scrape flutter either. And let's see what the next one is. So there is the same graph on the left, and this is a new scrape flutter either. And you can see that there's still a bunch of trash here that wasn't in the left-hand version, but it's a great deal lower. So that's my proof that it's worth replacing these if you really care about high frequency flutter. And the other thing is, uh, unfortunately, I don't have one of these graphs with the, the tough oil lubricant. This is with one of the other lubricants. But when on an ATR, unlike some machines, um, you can loosen the screw that holds the scrape flutter either down and push it back and forth. So in the back position, it's totally disengaged from the tape. And in the forward position, it's engaged rather too much. So the correct thing is somewhere in between. And this is with the old scrape flutter either where the shaft isn't in perfect condition. So on the left, this is the best I could get and still guarantee that the scrape flutter either wasn't going to occasionally stop rotating. And here's where it pushed full forward. And you can see that it's definitely got more flutter at some frequencies as a result of putting more force on the deteriorated bearing surface. That's the end of that slide deck. Um, let me stop screen sharing. And now, in terms of uh, scrape filters, <clears throat> Jeff Gilmore used to make uh, a PTFE, a Teflon one, a uh, fixed one. Have you ever played with that and measured it? I have not ever had my hands on one. I would like to, but of course, I don't think he has them anymore. Um, stories I have heard from other people that tried to use them and ran a lot of tape over them was, were that they wore out very quickly. Because mm -hmm. the, the Teflon that they were made out of is actually a pretty soft material. And what I heard was that the tape just wore a groove in it. And it was so effective when it was new, but it, yeah, but then it didn't last. Didn't last. It was an expensive part that didn't last. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, Excuse me, John. And, yeah. Uh, could you please describe how the measurements are made? I may have missed that. You may have already described. Well, that. I was going to proceed to that here. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and let me get to the right place here. There's what I use for a flutter meter. This is not the typical flutter meter that someone who services audio tape machines would probably own, but this is in designed for instrumentation tape recorders and has frequencies from 1.69 kilohertz up to 216 kilohertz. Um, I like to use 13.5 for audio machines because I can get flutter bandwidth up to about five kilohertz at that frequency. Um, the rest of it's pretty straightforward. Um, let me get this fired up here. Uh, that was the tape machine up. So here we have the tape machine, which I'll put into record. And I have to start the analysis software over on this other machine. Come on, baby, where's my cursor? Oh, come on, there it is. John, is that an old audio tape reel on the take up side? It is, you have sharp eyes. So if we look at the flutter meter, I can adjust the center frequency. And unlike audio meters, this actually measures peak to peak flutter with a what's called a statistical voltmeter. So this is on the 1% scale and it's 
set to five kilohertz floater bandwidth, and it's reading about 0.36%. And some of you may say, an ATR in good position, good condition, 0.36%, oh my God. But that's a real number. Uh, remember that audio flutter is typically measured in a very narrow bandwidth that's centered around seven hertz, I think, if I remember the weighting curve correctly. Um, so it ignores most of the flutter that you've seen on my graph. Um, if we switch over to here, you should see the spectrum analysis. Everybody seeing that? Yep. Okay, so that's the, the spectrum analyzer showing the DMOD output of the, the flutter meter. And over here, we have the major flutter component on an ATR, which is about two Hertz. And then we've got a little few other components up to about 40 Hertz. And here's the part that the other graph started about here, the ones we saw in the slideshow and extended up to where scrape flutter was, which was about there. And in this case, uh, this machine now has a new scrape flutterizer and new jewel bearings. And it is the scrape flutterizer that you just saw me servicing in the video. So it's freshly serviced. You can see that it looks pretty clean up there. Uh, if you want to know what happens when I stop the scrape flutterizer, I will stick the Q-tip into the scrape flutterizer. There's the scrape flutter. John, what's fluttering two times a second? Uh, that's the result of the uh, optical tack disc on the capstan motor. And that's related to how accurately the tack disc is centered on the capstan shaft. Um, some motors are better than others. This is about typical for an ATR. Um, I have occasionally thought about trying to come up with some electronic way to make that better, but it's one of those rainy day projects that hasn't happened yet. And the rainy day project that's more interesting to me on an ATR is completely rebuilding the uh, real motor drive system so that it doesn't run at 28.8 kilohertz and put a lot of digital garbage above the audio spectrum where I'm trying to recover bias. So- On how much of that flutter matters with music? Like what, what, what parts of that are gonna be really audible with typical music? Well, an ATR is a pretty clean machine. This is an ATR in pretty good condition. Um, You'd have to be, listen pretty closely to hear the result of defluttering this machine. Um, and the most important thing would be to take out the highest amplitude components, uh, which are the ones down here. I mean, the highest one is obviously the one at two Hertz. And if you clean this up, up to about, 60 hertz, um, it would sound better. But you'd have to have a good monitoring system and a good clean recording in order to really be able to hear the difference. Um, I suspect on this machine that taking out the stuff up here would make a very pretty small difference. So you could, so at best with this, you could tighten up the bass a little bit. Oh no, it's not just the bass, uh, because this stuff puts sidebands on every musical component all the way up through the, the musical spectrum. So this will change the tonality of the, the recording over the entire frequency range. Uh. 
And, you know, the, the, the other thing is that you've sometimes heard, which I think you commented on the other day, was that it affects the uh, perception of things like reverb tails in the recording. Um, nobody has a good explanation for the psychoacoustics of that, but I've certainly heard it and other people have as well. Chris Myring put a comment in the uh, chat saying that the capstan circumference is seven and a half, seven point five inches. I don't know how that uh, relates. That's to correct. Me. Yeah. So once around, and that uh, error is not due to generally to the machining on the capstan surface. It's due to the the imprecise centering of the tack disc, so that the capstan servo system is actually introducing that wow as a result of trying to follow the slightly off-center tack disc. Other comments by people? So would it go down to one <clears throat> to one hertz at seven and a half inches and four and go up to four hertz at 30 inch 30 inches? Yes, it would. Oh, the other thing I should mention if we look at this graph, um, this is actually calibrated. Is it gonna switch back to me again? I'm talking, so it ought to switch back to me, but it hasn't done it. Yeah, I'm it. doing that manually here. Yeah. All so right, let's so like you, back to me. Uh, hey, Dan? I, yeah, I didn't do anything. Yeah, I, I am trying to spotlight John and, oh, there it is. There he is. Okay. There we go. So when we come back to this, I don't know if you can read the scale on the left-hand side, but uh, where my cursor is is minus 40, and that's calibrated to 1% flutter. So minus 60 is a tenth of a percent flutter, and minus 80 is 0.01% flutter. So this two hertz flutter, that's maybe 0.02%. And our single number figure is just like THD, it's the, um, the summation, the algebraic summation. Um, depends upon what flutter meter you're using. Simple well, flutter meters just yeah. measure an average. Um, the DIN standard has some other more sophisticated voltmeter, and I can't recite that one off the top of my head. And the um, instrumentation meters have what they call a statistical voltmeter, which is basically measuring the percentage of the time that it's beyond two standard deviations. Is yeah, the standard yeah it's selectable onto one, two, or three there, segments. Yeah, right, yeah. And the default is two. Right. But uh, would it, wouldn't it still be true? I mean, in terms of, I guess I, my question is more in terms of figuring out the calibration uh, on your R, uh, RTA. Ah. Well, I calibrate the RTA. Well, I can show you actually, if I go back to that. Um, there's a test button on the flutter meter. And right. what it does is it- I guess I've never a, looked at that online. I've got an 8300. All right. So if you put it in the test position, it's supposed to read 1%. Right. So oh, so, so you're taking the peak of, that, of the uh, main lobe as one main lobe, and I put it at minus 40. So right. there may be a slight error in that calibration. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that probably is, no I, I, got you, I got what you're saying. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Chris, did that answer your program or your question about what program? What oh, which FFT program? program? Um, yeah. It's a program called Spectra Plus. Um, it's relatively expensive. I think the version I have cost about $1,400, uh, but I love it. I couldn't live without it. It's a spectrum analysis program that allows me to do 
to set all kinds of different things. And it tells me exactly what it's doing in engineering terms. And yeah, I can set it to do crazy things that don't make any sense, but I, I can also set it to do exactly what I want. And if I understand what I want, I can make it do that. So unlike some other programs, which are good at making pretty pictures and very bad at telling me how it got the pretty picture. So um, that's basically my presentation. Uh, happy to continue discussing this subject or entertaining any further questions. Yeah, I think maybe Dan was asking uh, for Chris about the circumference of the uh, capstan, and I think he maybe did not realize that the ATR100 has a very unique capstan system without a pinch roller, so. Correct. The 7.5 inches can, sounds big for a traditional pinch roller. I can zoom capstan. in on here and let's see. There we go. Ah, tripod is not cooperating. But that, put a little more light on the subject. You can sort of see it there. That's a, a rather large capstan, no pinch roller. It's rubber coated on the outside, although the originals were metal. And the tape simply wraps around it from here over to there. And the real tension is maintained accurately enough that it doesn't slip. It's it's funny on this video it looks like that capstan is like wobbling. Ah, uh, the, the <laughs> uh, knob on the top, which is what you can grab if you want to turn it manually, is mounted to the shaft with a set screw, which is right there going into the side of it, and it's not a very tight fit. So this whole aluminum thing on the top is simply mounted on the top of the capstan shaft with one set screw, and it's not very precisely machined. So it is wobbling. It's a bit disconcerting at first, but um, the surface down here that the tape goes around is not wobbling at all. So I'm unfamiliar with the, the rubber addition to this capstan, because I've seen the originals, they looked like they were uh, like slotted uh, aluminum. Right? Correct. And the the uh, timer roller in this machine is still the aluminum version. Don't know if I can light this up well enough that you can see it. Black aluminum? It's anodized. black anodized aluminum. And come on. This is a cheap tripod. Oh, yeah. There, you can sort of see it. It's got little grooves vertically through it. Um, the grooves are to release air, which would otherwise be trapped between the roller and the tape, as the, the tape wrapped onto the roller. And if you didn't have those grooves, it would be much more likely to slip, particularly at high speed. And so that's why it's got the that's why it's got the grooves in it. And the other side has got a rubber addition. The other one has the has a made by ATR Services rubber capstan. Rubber or polyurethane? Rubber. Ah. Ethan makes the polyurethane ones. Right. And, and Gilman uses ATR uses, uses rubber. Okay. Let's see if I can light that up. There you go. Sort of see it. Mm -hmm. So that's grooved. Circumferal groove. There. Yeah. So the grooves are supposedly providing air relief on the capstan as well. Um, I imagine they don't want to put vertical slits in the rubber because you'd probably pick that up as high frequency flutter. Have you had uh, ATR recenter any um, 
disc on a capstan, a metal capstan? And they say um, they offer that service. Uh, what's in here is um, an exchange unit from them. And because what they want is you send in the old unit, which they can rebuild, and they'll send you one of the rebuilt ones from their stock. Um, supposedly, uh, they have recentered the TAC disks on the ones that they're sending out. Um, and when I replaced this about two years ago, I did notice that the, the two hertz flutter was lower on this capstan than it was on the, the one I sent them back. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that George says that there's no way to take an old one and, and redo it without recentering, putting on a new disc, recentering it. Yeah, well, I Over don't know the exact thing. procedure that either one of them uses, but right. they claim that they make them better. And my experience is that they do. Yeah, I, I, I agreed. But they, I, I did notice that on their website, they have it says, we will recenter uh, old ones. So I was just didn't know if you'd had that experience or not. Don't know what they do with the ones that get sent back, whether they can take them apart and reuse them or not. Um, although I suspect that they may in some cases reuse them because um, one of the things I was told by ATR was that um, if the TAC disc wasn't in good condition, they were going to charge me more money. Uh, okay. Okay, so it sounds like George <coughs> at Athan is making his own TAC disc. Uh, so it's just part of his cost as opposed to reusing them because he gets all sorts of scratched up ones and et cetera, you know, things that have been handled poorly. Yeah. I imagine there's quite a few people that have tried to readjust the tactic up and made a fatal mistake. So yeah, <laughs> I've seen them. Those grooves on the, on the two cap stands uh, reminded me that of Gary's comments about the gauge blocks and how you can put them together with oil and they would be very, very, very difficult to pry up. It, that, re that reminded me of watching videos of a glass factory, I guess, where there's a 12 foot by six foot piece of glass that comes off of a machine or something and is vertical and these guys have it next to a big flat stainless steel or something metal table and have it transition from vertical to horizontal by simply letting it free fall onto this. And the, the air is enough of a sponge when it gets down to something that's super flat like glass to coming onto something super flat like stainless steel that it just lands softly and then they can slide it. So in, in the case of the gauge blocks, particularly with them being so flat, isn't that when they're, when they're tight, there's no air in between them. So that's part of a definition of a vacuum maybe. So you can't, you, you need a groove to get it up and with no grooves, you can't get it up. So the air fills in So that. Well, if you, if you push hard on them, you, you can, push well, them yeah. sideways and slide them off yeah. but yeah but you can't lift it up but this the air that could be under the cap stand under the tape that makes sense that they don't want it there they leave it a path to get out so that it goes regularly and and uh, right. not weirdly not however it wants i mean the other odd thing about atrs is that the capstan stays engaged in fast wind modes. Hmm. There's no difference. It's just that the capstan motor speeds up to the point where you've got fast forward or rewind. Mm -hmm. John, I had a, this is Dave. I had a question about the, uh, the rubber part that's put on the capstan there. Um, I would think that that would have to be precisely ground somehow to ensure that that doesn't introduce additional flutter components. Or is it because there's a tactist involved that's being compensated for? I, I just, that seems kind of odd that they would put something that's actually uh, somewhat of a flexible material uh, on a precision surface like that. It does. And I have no idea how they grind them to the required precision, but 
they do. I, I had two other comments I wanted to mention. Uh, um, I've taken apart uh, scrape flutter idlers before, and I've never broken the assembly apart deep enough to determine if, like a watch or clock, that like a chronometer type clock, that there's a you know typically in a jewel bearing you have a whole jewel and a cap jewel. So there's actually four jewels in like a balance wheel type of a jewel assembly. Um, I'm assuming it's the same at those. There's a whole jewel and then there's a, a flat cap jewel underneath because that's actually what the end of the pivot rests on, at least in the in the lower. I jewel. have always assumed that, but I can't see deeply enough into the hole yeah, with the microscope could... to confirm that. Okay, neither could I. The other thing I wanted to mention, I saw in the video uh, ultrasonically cleaning, you had put the uh, jewel assemblies at the bottom of the uh, cavity for the ultrasonic cleaner. Just want to mention that some ultrasonic cleaners caution you never to run the cleaner with anything actually bouncing on the bottom of the pan of the cavity. You should always have it in a basket. Now this of course yeah. varies with the different types of cleaners. The kind of cleaner you're using, I've used before and they don't seem to have any caution in that. But some of the older units, particularly higher powered units, that bothers the, uh, the uh, piezo, whatever they use for the transducer. And it may also diminish the effectiveness of the cleaning. I don't know, I just wanted to th throw that out there. If I was using one of the high powered industrial ones, I would certainly use the basket. Um, using this grade of cleaner, I've never had any problem either with lack of cleaning effectiveness or damaging the, the bearings, so. Those are pretty low powered cleaners. In fact, that's probably good to err on the side of low power because uh, you can get a lot of damage in ultrasonic cleaning inadvertently. Uh, with, and so you've got to be kind of careful how you use them. They seem very innocuous, but some things can actually be damaged quite severely by improper ultrasonic cleaning. Cleaning. Yeah, I imagine if you had a higher power enough one, you could probably take, stand a chance of chipping the jewel. So you would certainly wouldn't want to do that. Hey, John. I mean, clearly this gets it clean, so no point in searching for one that's higher power when this one does the job. Hey, John. Question yeah. about um, the scrape flutter idler. So for for like frontline use of a tape machine, what what sort of um, maintenance do you need to do regularly with them? Um, basically what you saw me do. <laughs> so then the so you don't need to clean them when you clean the heads and clean the guides. Oh, you mean cleaning the surface of it? No, I never clean the surface of it unless there's some obvious, I mean, it's a nice shiny surface. So if there's a piece of oxide stuck on it, it's usually pretty obvious. And yeah, I'll clean that off. But I don't routinely clean the surface of them when I clean the heads and guides. Do you uh, like to just spin them with your finger and listen? And... Well, yeah, I'll spin it with my finger and see how long it rotates. Yeah. But if I hear anything when I spin it with my finger, then it's, it's usually long gone by that time. So by the time you hear it making a noise, it's been uh, running without lubricant for weeks or months. And it looks like the one that my friend bought on eBay and it's just dead. Uh, speaking of which, Tom had a question in an email which is when you clean the head, do you clean it side to side or up and down? And the answer to that, um, I've always done it side to side and I never really thought about why I did that. But I asked John French one day, he said, oh yes, side to side. If you have a head that has relief slots in it and you clean it up and down, you're likely to catch the edge of a lamination next to the relief slot and bend it. So you should never clean it up and down if it's got relief slots in it. If it doesn't have relief slots, it doesn't make much difference. And does everybody know what a relief slot is? No. Ah. Um, don't know that I have a picture that's, well, I can, if you look I, at it. Let me look for one. I yeah. have one that I, I cut on my, on my uh, 
a lathe with a milling attachment. Uh, it's in my tablet. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, right. Anyway, well, when, go ahead. Go when, ahead. Uh, if you looked at a worn head, what you'd see is that it had worn a groove into the head and the parts above and below the tape stuck out further. And when that happens, um, if you if the groove was worn by tape that was slightly undersized, and then you put on a roll of tape that's slightly oversized, the edge rides up over the, the edge of the groove that was worn by the narrower tape. So the solution to that problem is to take a very thin saw and cut a slot into the head directly above the, the top of the top track and below the, the bottom track. And there we go. Yeah, you can see it right there. All right. So when the head wears, um, it wears down, but it doesn't, the, the relief slot uh, guarantees that the edge of the tape is slightly into the relief slot. So you never have a slot that's exactly the tape width. It's wider than the tape width. John, does that have any bearing negative or positive on, on country laning? Uh, if you have a head without relief slots that's slightly worn and you have country laning, you're likely to have the an intermittent loss of high frequencies because it'll push the tape away from the head when the tape rides up over the, the lip at one edge or the other. And just for for everybody's uh, edification, con country laning, it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's Im imprecisely slit tape that rides up and down on the head as it goes over it, at, like a country lane. It's not a straight yes. road. So-called country laning, because if you laid out the tape on a table, just let it sit on the table, you look at a, a good piece of tape, if you put a precision of straight edge against it, it should be perfectly straight. But you look at the bad piece of tape and the piece of tape is doing this because the, the base is not perfectly straight. And some parts of the tape are like this, some parts of the tape are like this. And when that goes through the tape machine, it will have a, well, it does several things. It depends on the tape machine. Uh, usually it'll have a periodic azimuth variation uh, as a result of the tape rotating like this as it goes across the head. And uh, if you put it on something like an ATR, which has forced guidance where the space between the bottom guide and the upper guide is actually less than the tape width, in the worst case, you can actually get it jumping off one of the bottom guides. It has to be pretty bad for that to happen, but I've seen it. Don, what about, the, what about cleaning the guides? Um, use the same stuff as the heads or do you use something stronger, with the, especially with the fixed guides? Um, I routinely use acetone to clean the guides. Um, for in between reels, if the reel hasn't shed a whole lot, I will use isopropyl on the heads. If it has shed a lot, I'll use acetone on the heads. Uh, a lot of people use xylene. Uh, I happen to dislike the smell of xylene and I'm, I'm more tolerant of acetone, so I use acetone, but it's about the same thing really. Do you have any advice about the uh, percentages of uh, isopropyl alcohol? They sell a lot of it in different percentages, and they don't tell you what the other percent is. I like to keep the unknown percentage as small as practical. Yeah. Which means I tend to prefer to buy the stuff that starts out at 98 or 99 percent. Of course, it doesn't stay there when you put it in a bottle in a room because it absorbs a little bit of water, but at least it's just water and not some other additive that I have no knowledge of. 
Yeah, I've heard that they can put gasoline and all sorts of stuff in there, and they don't have to say. Um, oh no. Back to I buy it, of if I buy it from a reputable chemical supplier, it's supposed to be more pure than that. Well, I think that to get it beyond a certain point, you have to use uh, a, a different solvent for the alcohol. To um, and I think the ninety-nine percent is benzene distilled. I can't find the ninety-nine percent in my uh, local drugstore. So yeah, I get it so, at Freddy's. So what were you going to say, Jerry? Yeah, Jerry. Uh, I was going to try and mix the uh, concept of country laning and uh, tape guidance. Uh, we had some, I had some experience with uh, eight track uh, machines at, at running at three and three quarters to make uh, cassette duplicator masters. Uh, these were MCI uh, 110C, believe I believe. Uh, and since the, the guides are only one one entering and one leaving the uh, uh, head block, there's no guide in the middle. So the whole the whole thing would basically the the height head height would change in the the middle between those two guides, which is like on, the, on one of the heads. Right. Um, and and we we could never solve that. Uh, it, we we sort of talked it up to. Uh, country laning of the tape stock, uh, but it was judged good enough and it always kind of bothered me to leave it that way. Did you ever try different kinds of tape, like European tape versus American tape or 3M versus Quantigy? Uh, well, we Ampex at that point. It, it didn't didn't get that far. It, got, it was judged good enough and I was happy to say goodbye to those machines. All right. I mean, one of the things I'm happy to have is several rolls of BASF tape made in the original German BASF factory um, before any of the machines got moved. And when I'm trying to set up guidance on a machine, I really prefer to have one of those reels of tape because I know that it's going to be straight. That would have been interesting, yes. Yeah, yeah the other story. Tape. Go ahead. I was going to say the European tape always seemed to have better or less country landing than the American tape. Yeah. Well, one of the stories I heard about the Quantigy factory is people used to complain about the slitting on Quantigy tape. And the Quantigy folks would always say, oh, no, no, we, we QC it at the factory and it always looks fine. Eventually, it was discovered that they were QCing it on ATRs. And somebody <laughs> said, uh, why don't you try that on a Studer? And they tried it on a Studer and they went, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why there was eventually a studer at the quantity factory i believe the tape stock we were using on those was 456 right because they always had a slitting problem some days it was better some days it was worse but it was rarely perfect Hey, John, Chris had a, uh, Chris in Australia had a couple of questions about 15 minutes ago. The first one, there was a story about an auto centering gadget they used at the Ampex factory, dot, dot, dot. I'm not sure what that relates to. Oh, that relates to installing the tack discs on the ATR capstans. Uh, okay. And I'm afraid that whatever technology that was is probably long lost unless it's known by somebody at ATR services. I think, wasn't there a paper uh, written on that process? Yeah, I think it was about the achieving zero run out on the bearings. Those would be different things, but yeah. Yeah, I've never investigated how they Center, um, center tack disc. So I just, there may well be a paper on it, but I've never looked for it. And then the other it's one thing of those things that I couldn't do anything about. So, right. <laughs> Buy a new the other, one. The other thing he asked was interested to know what you think of the AP scrape flutter system was based on work by Dale Mankin. Well, we haven't mentioned Dale Mankin's uh, meter. Yes. Um, and um, 
Dale, who was who realized everything we've talked about here and a great deal more way back in the 1960s and 1970s, built a flutter meter designed specifically for audio tape machines that used a 12 and a half kilohertz test frequency and made wideband measurements that could show scrape flutter and also measured AM modulation of the test frequency, something which I don't have anything that can do. And it's a very nice piece of equipment. I've used one, Steve Pontalillo owns one, um, but uh, I don't have one myself. Um, one of the things that I should do um, was to collect a bunch of papers together that might be interesting to people that want to pursue this subject in more depth and post them and send out a link to it. And I didn't have time to do that before this call, but I will and I'll send out a link. And that includes several of Dale's writings, um, which have a lot of information about how he discovered a lot of these problems and what he did about them. Yeah, there it is. Great. And uh, Chris replied, Chris in Australia replied about the auto centering thing. It involved a small hammer tapping the periphery. <laughs> <laughs> Is that auto? Auto Great. repair. Yeah. And Scott, jo Scott Dorsey. Yeah, I don't know. It us. sounds like that auto repair it, but it doesn't. Yeah, Scott Dorsey joined us and typed in, I don't think any tape was slid as poorly as 456. And Scott, if you want to comment, you should oh, have a microphone. Oh, that's not true. Look at some in. of the off-brand ones they sold under other brand names. Yeah. And Chris <laughs> wrote in a feedback loop with a W and F meter about the auto centering, auto centering. the hammering, small hammer. In a, uh, a, a note, with a w a note for uh, for John that if he wants to do uh, AM demodulation, you can if you use a uh, Hewlett Packard thirty five sixty two A, it will do all the all the uh, work for you. You just record the the frequency and play it in and demodulate it, and it's all in there. It's a very slow instrument and very old, but they they work great. Is that their, one of their modulation analyzers? Yeah, a dynamic signal analyzer, DSA. Right. 3562A, not the 61, which is the portable one. Uh-huh. Yeah, because it has AM and FM and, and uh, phase modulation, de uh, demodulation. Right. Alan, do you want to tell everybody how difficult it is to use that thing? I, I, I work at the HP plant where that was made. And the user interface in that is just atrocious. It is one of the most difficult instruments <laughs> well, to use. It's it's exactly like uh, John was describing his uh, RTA uh, software. It does everything, and all the parameters are there, which means that you got to know how to use it. And I don't find it difficult to use anymore because I I have two of them, and um, <clears throat> with an updated screen. And it it is deep, it is thick, and figuring it out the first time, yeah, that's that's a task. Uh, but it is a lot of that stuff is available in the instrument. Uh -huh. But it's old math, so you don't get the updated uh, like his RTA shows you the updated uh, thing as you're going along. But this is like averaging over the necessary uh, way uh, uh, cycles to get an accurate mathematical picture, which means that you're going to take a reading for two, three minutes before you even start processing. And then uh, it's going to give you a static picture at the output of that processing another minute or two later. But it's very accurate. Well, I mean, one of the interesting things uh, about Dale's meter was actually listening to the AM output. Uh, because you can hear all kinds of things that wouldn't show up in the average analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, they don't, they don't make those chips anymore because too many people were using them to uh, discramble uh, encoded uh, video signals and such. Uh, That's what happened well, with that chip. Yeah, I just haven't pursued any method. Well, partly because there's not a lot of things that I can do to tape machines that will affect the AM component. Right. One of the things Dale was interested in was measuring tape so that he could tell good tape from bad tape. 
which and hey, that's not i mean what can you do nowadays i mean you get what you get by you? this one or the other one yeah right <laughs> yeah anyway that's uh that's a piece a, a piece of kit that it's, is relatively inexpensive out there uh, although it is deep to learn and run right well, it sounds like my Lund kind of instrument. <laughs> yeah. John, the way on Flutter made a demodulated output that you were mentioning earlier, is that a FM demod or an AM demod? That's an FM demod. Okay. And if there's another tool, uh, tool HP out there that you can use for that, without buying a wire and flutter meter, which are harder to find, and that's the old HP 5210. It's a, um, oh, it's a weird piece of kit that does real-time demodulation. Uh, you'll need a low-pass filter because it does the, uh, the, the ones and zeros thing on it. So you need to, uh, so you uh, need to band pass filter it, but it gives you, also gives you a nice baseband output on the output of it. Without uh -huh. having a wow and flutter meter, and those go for a hundred bucks. Well, I didn't know what the market for uh, Micom or data check uh, flutter meters is, but uh, at least a few years few ago, when I was acquiring, hmm? few and far. Really? Yeah. No, because ten years ago there were a bunch of them out there for like a hundred or hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah. Must be they're all gone by this time. I think so. Yeah. about uh, alcohols our uh, seattle friend our late seattle mentor glenn white used to tell us that the only thing to clean heads with was 200 proof ethyl alcohol and insisted we keep some around all the time but i have the sneaking suspicion that he also liked to make martinis with it so uh, <laughs> we keep it around still it works pretty good <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine it would. There was a squeeze bottle in the AT, AV shop that had a, a label on it that said instant martini, add olive. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's like Everclear? Yes, it is Everclear, yep. except I think Everclear is, uh, I don't know, it's 198 proof or 190, I think. Yeah, apparently the moment you open it, it goes down, yeah. really. But yeah, 200 proof. We've got this uh, university stuff we buy. It says 200 proof uh, food grade or something like that. I had a, a yeah. friend that worked a friend that worked at Sure Brothers, and he said the uh, preferred stylus cleaner there was Smirnoff Silver. That was what they had on hand for their their in their phono lab. So that's a little inside story in that. So that should be like 40% ethyl alcohol and 60% uh, water? I believe so, yeah. I, I wanted to ask about if anybody has had experience uh, grinding real idlers, uh, if now's the time to ask that. Not me. So it's interesting. So everybody knows what a real idler is. Here's an old one. This is a three and three quarter, seven and a half machine with a smaller idler. And uh, over time, they get a groove worn in them. Um, and I asked Jay McKnight about this, and he said, unless the groove is really deep and it's affecting the tape guidance, uh, generally it's you know pretty randomized and uh, not to worry about it too much. If you look at the very first Ampex 350 manuals, there's a caution in there about disassembling the real idler, or removing the bearings, because there's wordage in there that says that the a uh, real idler surface was ground with the bearings in place. Now, they don't elaborate, but obviously it was turned on some sort of fixture, and then they had a, uh, a, a grind, grinding wheel designed for aluminum. I think you can use silicon carbide. In subsequent manuals, there's no mention of that. And uh, nobody I've talked to has ever come up with a, uh, a way to precisely grind them. And I'm, I'm told that you need to be two ten thousandths or better a run out on that. And uh, I thought about mounting a real either assembly with fresh bearings 
um, and then you know turning it independently with a motor and then making a sled like a lathe bed. But um, I just was curious if anybody's had experience doing that. No, I've thought about attacking that problem, but it's a little too far down the list to have gotten to yet. Um, I have the remains of an old Otari two inch machine, which has a nice solid casting on the top. And my notion was to machine up something that would mount the real idler solidly on the casting and a little arm with a piece of lapping film on it that would gently push against it and uh, try to gradually lap it down so that it was smooth again. But I don't know if I could build something that would work to that level of precision or not. I think a different approach might be uh, useful for at least for getting something before that level of, is approached. And that's to take a page out of the head handbook, put a relief slot in at the edge of where it's worn. Yeah, because there is a relief slot at the bottom to keep the tape from curling uh, into, in, into a, a radius and, and destroying the edge of the, of the tape. Um, uh, Scott mentioned that uh, Kurt Gresky used to uh, regrind real idlers. And I think actually, I remember uh, corresponding with him about that. And he had a, um, he, he centered it on a four jaw chuck and a lathe. And then he had a secondary nylon bearing that was supported a little bit beyond uh, the chuck. And that gave you a sort of a two point suspension. And he had that uh, second bearing in a steady rest. And um, you sometimes will get a chatter in that. And I don't, I don't think he, I think he used a very sharp tool. I don't know that he actually had a tool post grinder on it, um, but that might be one way of doing it. The problem is the setup on that takes so damn long uh, that by the time you get set up to do one, a one off, uh, you're, you're into it, uh, you know, three, four hours deep. And uh, yeah, well, that wouldn't have bothered Kurt, but if you're no. actually doing it on a bunch of them, it's a problem. Yeah, I, I have a tool post grinder, and uh, I've often thought about trying that. And, and you can get the uh, silicon carbide grinding wheels, which actually is uh, will work on aluminum. But uh, the, the problem is coming up with the device to center everything correctly. And ideally, what you want is you want to turn it. In, in its own bearing. So you wanna have the whole real either assembly in there with the flywheel off and, and then grind it in C2 like that, rather than trying to grind the lollipop when it's out of the bearing itself. I'll report back to class if I come up with any. <laughs> right. Well, we've got no meeting for no subject rather for the next two Mondays, so. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, do it. Do it, it live. A, have Dave yeah, do it right. live on, at the yeah. session. Yeah, I have to clean up my shop, and that's that's going to take more than two weeks. It's <laughs> it's it's uh, in in pretty poor repair right now. I got too much you and stuff. Me both. Going on. You yeah. and me both. I didn't clean up my shop. Oh, Gary, your shop is always clean. <laughs> yeah, really. Any other comments about this? Things to bring up. And Scott, if you have a microphone, you can ask your questions directly. It wasn't in the original internet specs, so Scott doesn't do it. Oh. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you could get a Hazleton terminal to get on Zoom here. <laughs> uh, Dan, you said something about uh, fluids and cleaning uh, substances earlier on. I did? didn't you? Or maybe it was somebody else. Sure. I talk about a lot of stuff. Go ahead. Ask your question. <laughs> well, I was just bringing up the subject. Okay. Uh, go ahead. That's the subject. Oh, you know, we talked about mm -hmm. alcohol and, and acetone has been mentioned. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't me. Somebody else. Anybody else? You know, Richard has asked about lubricants earlier and he hasn't returned. So I have no idea what that question was. Yeah. And Scott is talking about his steam powered internet connection, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Scott says his, you know, his DSL right. isn't strong enough for voice. 
Yeah. Oh. Wow. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, we are coming close to uh, three hours of meeting, and uh, we can keep going. Or if we don't have anything to talk about, we'll we'll bail. But if you if you want to talk about something, this is the time. And by the way, thanks for the great presentations today and the wonderful commentary from the attendees. That was good. This is not my thing, but it was good, definitely. So thank you. Yeah, I'm appreciative of uh, all the people that presented and uh, all the old friends that I have not uh, heard from for a long time and new people that uh, I've never really met. Yeah, just, that's the great thing about this, and we keep doing this, so come join. I'd just as soon call it quit so I can leave the office here. <laughs> what? You're leaving your tape machines? <laughs> yeah, really. How can that be? <laughs> well, it's only a temporary separation. Right. right. He's got more at home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Right. See, see you around. Yeah. See you next right. time. Hey, Dave. Yeah. See you all. Okay. Before you go, I'll point out that uh, even when we don't have topics, we have no trouble coming up with things to go three or four hours on. So uh, new people, thank you for coming and hope to see you again. And uh, if you want to be on the mailing list, the email list, which uh, Certainly, we announce meetings and stuff, but people like Tom Fine come up with something all the time during the week to that is interesting to talk about and, and type back and forth. So if you want to be on that, either write in chat right now or send me an email. And I think I, re I sent most of you something. So, and somebody is just now showing up. <laughs> So, <laughs> admin, yeah, yeah. So, welcome to the new person here, and uh, we're just wrapping it up. So, say your next, final goodbyes, everybody. The next one is next Monday, next Monday, a week from today, same time, which is 3 p.m. Seattle time. And I open the doors at 2 30 so that we can check out uh, audio and video so we don't have to horse around with getting stuff to work during the meeting. And we need a presenter. We're not desperate, but it would be nice if somebody wanted to share something. We'd be happy to hear it. Anything else from anybody? No, I think I'm talked out on my subject anyway. So <laughs> I don't think so. I think there's a lot more to share, but <laughs> we'll, we'll hear it another time. OK, well. Hey. Let's go Thanks, home. Thanks, Jerry. Yep. Thanks, Gary. Thank Dan, Thanks, one, Alan. Dan, one second. We'll talk about that other thing you asked me about. Yes. Okay. okay. I will I, hang on. Can I go? Yes. Everyone can go. Okay. See you guys. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Take everybody. Care, everybody. All right. All right. And I'm going to stop recording here. <laughs>